Cause you're listening to Jams and T You won't see the show On your TV So we talk about things Musically Cause you're listening to Jams and T Listening to Jams and T Welcome everyone to a brand new episode of the Jams and Tea Podcast Where we spill the gins and spin the tea I know, shut up Hello everyone I hope that you're all having a splendid day, and I hope you're ready to talk about some really nice music today. We're going to talk about, first, I think, up on the list is uh, Open Mike Eagle's the first album, first... Anime Trauma. When, when you divorce. look at the spreadsheet, <laughs> first is All Ticker, and then second is, oh, second is Open well, Mike Eagle. Oh, I God, mean, I'm such a fucking it's disaster I mean, it's Jake, not it's not like it matters it really does fair enough and then the other album we're going to talk about is uh this fucking fucking stupid ass band called all attacker ne- never famous. heard of them yeah. i'm the i'm the stealth third member yes full time i've been a, i've been a psyop designed specifically for tyler so, oh my God. so so two very different but special artists today we're going to yes. be breaking down their new album and on the record club episode we are going to be talking about tyler's recommended album this week which is ultra visitor by square pusher Indeed. which is a very bleep bloop record and we have things to say about except, that except I'm when sure. it's not a bleep bloop record yeah. except when it's an <laughs> we'll get into that when we get into that indeed like, there are bleeps there are bloops there are blips there are blops folk? Drum and it's, bass, I believe, is also you're, the term. You're overthinking it, Sersha. It's yeah. not a folk record. <laughs> it is not. <laughs> no. Right. But that's a different uh, video. So you need to go and watch yeah. that video after yeah. you've watched yeah. this video. Yeah. yeah. And, and if, you're, uh, if you're not subscribed to the channel, subscribe. Get a grip. And hit the bell. Do it. And, and hit the comments. Hit the bell. Hit, hit like, the comment, subscribe. You, uh, you, you know, get the death grip so, and get got subscribed. And now we're going to talk about what we have been listening to this week. Who wishes to start? We can um, go in our conventional order if you would like. Oh, okay. Um, well, uh, I was not here last week, so I will briefly shout out the highlight of last week that I did not get to mention on this show. And that is, of course, Miles Davis's Bitches Brew. Oh. This is the best jazz record I've heard, and certainly my favorite. And it's it's oh my god, I've not been able to stop listening to it. It's almost two hours long, and I don't care. <laughs> it's, it's truly enormous. Drink full and descend. And I and I did, and it was delicious. Get it because um, it's a. Cause it's a brew, cause, cause, cause. Um, but yeah, if you're looking for a, like again, not that you need me to tell you, but uh, if you're looking for a good jazz or jazz fusion record, maybe check that one out. It's quite good. Um, I also uh, was listening uh, this week and last week was listening to a lot of Opeth, uh, and I had a bit of. A bit of, Who are um, you and what have you done with Jake? I, <laughs> anyway, it's Ghost Reveries. I have this on vinyl now. Um, Ghost, Ghost Reveries is an album that I have always, for, uh, from Opeth, that I have always loved. One of my most listened to Opeth records. And I, I listened to it in conjunction with Tyler. Um, at the same time, I listened to it twice in one day. Uh, we threw that shit on, and it, it, the communal enjoyment of that experience made me finally bump that record up to a 10, as it deserves to, to be considered. I love it quite dearly. It's not as quite as revered as some of what is considered the top-tier Opeth stuff, but I do genuinely think it is as good, if not better, than those records. Uh, but, I mean, why even mince words about fucking which Opeth records you like? They're all fucking good. The, the good ones, anyway. And The good ones are good. The good ones are good. And I have also been on, on, buoy. on this week a bit more specifically. Um, I have been on a bit of a heavy metal kick. Uh, and I, I just have all the visual aids today. I listened to... I was trying to sort of 
figure out what my favorite definitive heavy metal record album is. And it was a, a toss up between two of them. Uh, one of them I'll just go ahead and mention is Metallica's Ride the Lightning, which, you know, we talked about that before. Uh, I think it's pretty good. I listened to it all the way through <laughs> four times this week. Um, I don't really know why. I, I just really liked doing that. But the other record in question was Judas Priest's Painkiller. This album... And I love it. Uh, it, it. It is probably, if I had to pick between the two, I would probably pick Ride the Lightning very, very, very narrowly just because I do think it is the record that is aged slightly better despite being older. Uh, that said, this thing rips from beginning to end. Uh, Judas Priest just fucking, they, they rarely miss and they have been hitting for 50 fucking years somehow. Would and you believe they, that I have never heard a Judas Priest album? You should really fix that, should. considering you like shit like Metallica and Iron Maiden. I mean, it's pretty, uh, it's pretty essential. They, they have like four records that have just been like considered, I think, basically elite tier on the level of stuff like Ride the Lightning. There's like that. There's the more recent one, Firepower, which is fantastic. There's their earlier, slightly I, progressive stuff, Saturn's yeah, Destiny. I'm uh, definitely familiar with, with their catalog just pr- from like wanting to learn about bands. But I just yeah, never just if you got start with Painkiller. Like them, just, yeah. it, it, there, there are other records that like are as good or on that level. It won't like spoil you or anything, but just like, just listen to Painkiller. It'll, it'll treat Sick. you good. Uh, and, that, and that reminds me, um, uh, just because uh, the uh, death metal progenitors, death, have a cover yeah. of Painkiller. Oh um, God, it's so early, fucking good. <laughs> early uh, 2021, we need, need to do a death B-sides. 100,000 percent. I, I mean, am there. It's just, I mean, the best discography in metal. Have any down. of you even heard a death album? I, you know, <laughs> holy <laughs> shit! Yeah. This is oh happening. Oh my god! Oh, and I get to How completely lose. Um, like what? Six? Six? Five or six? Yeah. Okay. I get reasonable. to completely fucking lose my mind over leprosy in front of everybody. Yes. <laughs> Jake, oh, Jake, I, leprosy I is something it. to be taken seriously as a condition. I knew. I, why did I fucking know you were gonna say that? Um, mm. fourth record I will mention. Uh, it's sort of a prelude to, to today's discussion, but I have with me Open Mike Eagle's Dark Comedy. Um, this is my favorite record of his. Um, it's fantastic. Uh, basically quintessential Open Mike Eagle. I will elaborate on to, as to what that even is later, but um, if you want to get into his stuff, this and Brick Body Kids Still Daydream are the two records that you will want to go with. It is funny it is irreverent it is as the title implies it is slightly dark introspective but it's it, and it has it's it's so it's so well produced it sounds so good the beat on shit like ice king dreams oh mwah, love it perfect uh last thing i will mention is i listened to i i'll just throw this out there just because I put this or I just finalized this as an album that we will more than likely uh, be covering is that today I listened to the new Paul Bearer album uh, because that dropped today Uh, and I mean look it's doom metal I'm already kind of sold already but whoa that shit caught me off guard because it was really good like really good i i am a big am fan a, of mr beerer he he's that's i hate that you have unintentionally referenced the manager of the undertaker oh what a day Je- jeff What's a jeff lovely day? bearer paul bearer but yeah that's... paul bearer is a great band foundations of burden still love that album ooh, i'm excited ooh, to hear the that, new one 
I, the Foundations of Burden gets a little bit slept on, I think. I'm glad that you appreciate that record. I also just think, like, they, just generally speaking, their discography, while not large, like, Foundations of Burden, Sorrow and Extinction, and Heartless are all absolutely fucking excellent. Like, just quintessential doom metal listens that, like, everybody should hear. And uh, they have a new addition to that with their new record, if you ask me. So uh, I look forward to elaborating on that later. Sick. All right, August, what have you been listening to? Okay, well, I uh, I guess I'll start with the one I've been nonstop talking about, uh, and I'll encapsulate a whole kind of six albums, I believe, and just, no, four, in just one. Uh, Rush's Moving <laughs> Pictures. I've, of course, been going through the discography of Rush, as I've been commenting on in our group chats i think moving pictures is it's obviously like their most heralded classic record it's amazing uh, i yeah what what do i say about moving pictures it's it's amazing it's really yeah, i mean good. you say you say it's great and then you move on yep. yeah, exactly uh then i modern listen- day warrior Another record that I can just say is great and move on that I listened to, Marvin Gaye's What's Going On, the recent number one on the Rolling Stones' Top 100. I mean, it's moving on. Uh, (laughs) I I love the song where he just sings about how much you should believe in God, and it's just that for like three or four minutes. It's a a shame it's not Sing to God by Cardi. Oh! That's the album's really good, though. <laughs> okay, so next one. Uh, figured I should do kind of a progressive rock classic, so I went and listened to Frank Zappa's Apostrophe. He's best. It's amazing. It's really, it's ridiculously just, it's really funny, it's really short. Gets to the point, it's, it's apostrophe. Listen Frank it Zappa again. is an August core artist if there ever was one. Mm. Yeah, <laughs> pretty much. Really good. Uh, I also listened to Tangerine Dreams, Alpha Century, their second album, and one of the earliest albums in the kind of progressive electronic space rock uh, not space rock, space ambient genre, I mean to say. And it is comfortably mid if if you're not into that kind of thing i cannot see it doing anything for you because it is pretty much it's impressive for the time but it's about as milk toast of a record as you could get in that style nowadays so it's no glacier flower is what you're saying yeah yeah exactly And uh, last, One of Tricks Point Never's Replica, a record I had heard a long time ago, like earlier this, not a long time ago, like I heard it at the start of the year, didn't really get it, but now I've come back to it recently and I've really been loving it. Fantastic record, fantastic kind of concept behind the production. It's, it's really neat. And that's covering him soon, aren't we? Too. We are, uh, I believe, in two weeks' time. Ah, uh, yeah. Yes. So, right. Morgan, I I'm gonna be I'm gonna level with you. Outside of the three things that we had to listen to this week, I didn't. I listened to nothing. Wow, not, not a single thing. So, fair, fair well, I mean, to be fair, this is. I mean, this is two of the records we're covering today are are fairly dense. So I can't blame you. Mm. No, yeah, I'm certainly, mm. yeah, glad that it seems like you've all sort of taken the time to really soak into them because I know that's been necessary for me for both of those albums. That's mm. what they deserve. Yeah, and the Open Mike Eagle fair, record yeah. too. I'll get into yeah, that when we review it. Oh yeah, it's just that the Open Mic Eagle record is a 34-minute fun hip hop album, and then the yeah. other two are like dense IDM soundscape porn. Yeah, and they're both over an hour long. And... Oh, um, so Sersha, what have you been listening to? Okay, so again, I'm gonna level with you. Um, I have listened to albums, um, uh, but I listened to six Mountain Goats records this week. Um, Can't imagine why. 
I know. Um, and I'm going to listen to 12 more by hopefully... Oh. Um, so that we can get certain content out by before ah. Friday for a reason. Um, yep. oh. Okay. Can Sarah's just, just done the ultimate done musical balls. cram session. Oh. <laughs> and then jumped onto the computer. Oh, dear. Uh, that was oh. not pleasant. <laughs> August gets a feline vasectomy live on camera. <laughs> yeah, I uh, but I've listened to four other records, all of which were re-listened. Um, yeah, I all have also listened to Rich Body Kids' Still Daydream by Open Like Eagle. Great record. Uh, fucking loved it. Well, I, try, I tried to re-listen to Dark Comedy as well, just didn't find the time. Um, I re-listened to Song for Our Daughter by Owen Laura Marling. Um, it is it is still one of it has only increased in my admiration for it the more I've listened to it. Um, uh, and I think that's true of uh, all of her records, but this one specifically has a real um, she really opens herself up on this one instead of clouding her autobiographical storytelling in really sort of dense folklore heavy metaphors. I mean, there's stuff like that on this record, like Alexandria, but um, mostly it's just really naked uh, personal storytelling. Um, and, and not in the Semper Femina way, um, if that, ma- that makes sense, Laura Marling fans. Anyway, um, I also listen, re-listened to Monin by Art Blakey, which I fucking oh. love, still love it. Uh, one of my favorite jazz records. Um, and I also re-listened to Brave Faces Everyone <gasps> by yes. Spanish Love Songs. Um, yes, I'm, my power. We are set to, well, the first time I listened to it, it happened to be the week after the Idols review, but I was going to listen to it anyway. Um, but your review was amazing. We are due to um, talk about it a bit more in 2021, I think. Well, yeah, um, we're going to have it for a record club episode. And I'm going to listen to it so many times between now and then. Um, just so many bands want to be this, and only yep. this is this. Yeah. Could a depressed that's person pro- that's do profound. this? profound. <laughs> yeah. I mean the album's kind of it's, not, it's the album's like it's not profound it's just very insightful. yeah insightful um, and it's very good at conveying pretty complicated emotional states in word form with pretty straightforward lyrics which is super fucking impressive I am always very impressed when artists can transform complicated things into simple lyrics and have it all get conveyed um, and they do it um, and I like it um, and the guitars are so fucking satisfying. Mm. Um, Tasty. Really great rock record. Um, yeah. So though all four of them are like 10 out of 10s, in my opinion. Um, and I'm going to hand over to Tyler. Cool. Um, so I don't have a lot of... I have not have not listened to a lot of new m- music this week. I listened to some Open Mic Ego, obviously, to prepare for this review. I listened to Dark Comedy, which I liked quite a bit. A uh, really strong record. I especially loved the first two songs on it. Uh, Dark Comedy, mm. Morning Show, and Qualifiers, I think, are incredible songs. Qualifiers uh, and- is one of the best hip-hop songs of the last decade, and it is insanely clever. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it was, I was really kind of taken aback listening to it, and I had high expectations for that record anyway. Um, if, it, if the record has a fault, it's that the rest of it is just not quite as good as those first two songs, but it is still very good. Uh, Unfair assessment. Uh, even better, though, uh, is uh, Brick Body Kids Still Daydream, which I had heard uh, closer to when it came out, but I revisited this week. Uh, it's amazing. It's, yep. it's a near-perfect album. Um, the first three-track run, especially on that record, is just bananas how good it is but then you get like later album highlights as well like the Daydream beats and the on it are wild as hell yeah oh yeah it's so good and and yeah and special shout out to 95 radios as well which i really love that song amazing song yeah but i, I basically love every song on that record so it's yep. it's yeah it's it's really special it's um true. I, in terms of things I listened to for the first time this week, so I listened to the new Dorian Electra album, uh, My Agenda. So for those who don't know, Dorian Electra is kind of like an, an uh, is a sort of non-binary artist from the sort of hyper pop scene who came uh, into the public consciousness 
last year with their sensational record flamboyant which is kind of like a, a cheeky uh tasteful and fun uh provocation of like gender stereotypes and sub and 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 yeah it was super i i highly recommend it it's a very fun record when i say hyper pop it's much more kind of composed and and less sort of insane whereas um my agenda is very much in the 100 gex vein of hyper pop it's abrasive it's messy as fuck it's all over the place musically um and i'm and look i know i'm as far as this group goes i'm basically the resident kind of like hyper pop person i'm the person mm-hmm. most likely to come to a defense of a record in their vein but this album sucks man it's just really i have bad. heard lots of bad things on the timeline it's just really really it, it see it, it's a good exercise in like saying that just because something is musically messy uh does not necessarily mean it is good or bad like mm. i'm trying to think of a counter example i guess it's it's not a perfect alignment but if you want to consider something like the black dresses album from this year that's a record that is musically kind of very unconventional and abrasive and unwelcoming um but for me anyway, and for, for Saoirse as well, there's a, there's a real kind of emotional pull to it and a kind of sense of purposefulness and, and, and actual composition. Whereas um, my agenda is clearly an exercise in trying to make something as off the wall as possible musically. And it just falls flat. Um, a lot of the kind of really uh, insightful and funny observations about gender and masculinity uh, from the first record, um, they try to kind of continue doing that kind of stuff on this new record, but it feels very undercooked. Uh, the ideas are just less inspired. It's just more kind of cheap. And, and again, it just feels like, and I know it's probably because a bunch of it was produced by Dylan Brady, but it just feels very, very much like 100 gigs in the tree of clues sort of thing where it's like, (laughs) I mean, at least this album is much shorter than that record, but, but yeah, it's just, there is one pretty good song on it called Ram It Down, which I presume is not a tribute to the Judas Priest album, but um, there's still a pretty good song. Um, Please do not start with Ram It Down, please. Whatever you do. (laughs) No, I know. They don't miss often, but when they do. Yeah. I just saw it on their Write Your Music page and I wanted to make that comparison. Um, yeah, it's a good song. But anyway, most of the records suck. It's, it's bad. I'm glad we never chose to review <laughs> it. Um, which is a shame because I did. I liked Dory and Elytra as an artist very much and I especially like what they stand for with their music and it's just a shame this doesn't land for me. Um, yeah, and I'll just shout out one other thing. It's a re-listen. Uh, so... It's another artist we're reviewing today. I've uh, re-listened. I mean, I'm always listening to Orteca, right? You know that. It's, yeah. it's kind of a meme <laughs> at this point. But I, I actually took the time uh, earlier this week. I sat down and I re-listened to uh, their 2016 release, Elsick, uh, which, which is a four-hour album in, in sort of five different segmented parts. But I listened to it uh, for the first time ever completely all the way through in one go. Uh, which I do not recommend <laughs> at all. Uh, it, it's it's a lot to take in. It's and I think that even though it's half the length of their NTS sessions project from 2018, it's arguably an even more difficult and, and demanding release than that because yeah, that record has a lot of kind of variation and it's kind of all over the place with this sort of sonic palette. Whereas Elsick is much more consistently dark. Um, but it's yeah, I did, I made the decision this week that it's my favorite or ticker album. Um, even over Confield. So that was a pretty big um, decision for me anyway, because it's like, yeah, they're my favorite, my favorite artist. And yeah. And, and so that I decided that was my, that's my favorite record by them. I'm always listening to at least part of it right, pretty much every day. Um, yeah. It's amazing. It's, it's very, very special, uh, but I won't linger on it too long because we're going to talk plenty about Orteca today. And I, oh, yeah. I don't want to rub that in. <laughs> Uh, so let's just move on. Right. 
Okay. I will ask I guess... out of curiosity, um, of those two really long I'll take her projects, what should I what should I listen to first? <laughs> uh, I just like I, I want to approach one of those. Yeah. I just don't know which one would be the better option. It's definitely the more difficult one. Well, not definitely, but I, I think it is a more difficult one. But I think that LSEC is the better choice um, because okay. it's well, it's the better album for starters, um, and uh, yeah, it's 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 and it has just incredible highlights. I think, but yeah, it's it's challenging, and the the fact that it's segmented into five um, is kind of perfect because you can just listen to one at a time. There are like yeah. fifty minutes each. You can listen to one at a time over the course of like a week and and get through it that way. Um, and I wouldn't begrudge anyone doing that, but yeah. And that lets us segue into our first segment, where we talk about how to cr- Don't, don't, <laughs> don't Sigma. fucking go how, there. How we- many times have we already introduced a ticker on this show? <laughs> Too many. Never. <laughs> Um, and we talked about we LP5 did. on a record club. Yes, Tyler yeah, also has his... Degrees. Yes, and Tyler also has his worst to best. If you have not seen that, very important viewing, mm-hmm. perhaps, I yeah. would say. That, Go check an, it out. I, I, after, I did, after this, no more I'll take her. <laughs> I did I'm do banning. A, I, for those who don't know, I did do a worst to best video on all the albums up until this point. Uh, before mm-hmm. Sign came out, um, but that video is very much designed for people who have an interest in Ortega but haven't necessarily listened to a lot to be able to watch. So don't feel like you have to. Me. You don't feel like you have to like be an expert to enjoy the video. I've tried to make it descriptive and informative without being, you know, fan mm-hmm. a fan only kind of thing. Exactly. Well, for those who know nothing about Ortega, um, so Tyler is a resident Ortega expert. I'll, I'll, look, so, I'll keep it brief. They're an IDM, yeah. an IDM duo um, from the UK uh, who have been making electronic music since the early 90s. Uh, they, this is their 14th album. Uh, I actually won't go into the context too much because I'm going to sort of discuss it in my review anyway. Um, but yeah, this is, they're incredibly prolific, let's just say. Uh, they've had a storied and dense and and interesting career arc, I think. Very interesting. Um, regardless, even if you hate their music, I feel like it would be difficult to to try and argue their career arc has not been interesting. Um, mm. But yeah, um, I, I, I've tried to think all week whether I should go first or last with my review. And I haven't been able to decide. So maybe one of you should decide for me. Do Do both at the same time. <laughs> and then t- Tyler attempts that and then suddenly his mouth will just like glitch and then he'll start somehow producing Autecker sounds with I, his I mean, mouth. I mean, look, um, I know Tyler probably has loads to say. I know I personally also have loads to say. Um, and I feel like Tyler's would probably be better to um, actually close out on like an expert's take. Um, that's my own two cent on the matter. That, um, that sounds... You guys think. Perfectly fair. Um, well, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll read the first paragraph, which is kind of the setting the scene part of my review, and then I'll save the rest for later. Okay. It all ended in 2018. Following the expansive, dense sonic excursions of XI and Elsec, twin masterpieces that each saw Orteker pushing their sound to more abstract, darker places, the duo released eight hours of material via NTS radio across four separate weekly installments of two hours apiece. Together, they formed the duo's 13th album, which culminated in their most impressive and career-defining achievement to date, the hour-long, rippling, gargantuan All End. That track tied a bow around the most musically progressive and uncompromising era of their career to date, it was clear to many Orteker fans that this was them clearing the slate for a new variation of their sound. And recent interviews confirmed that shortly after NTS, the duo completely rehauled their system. So now in October, 2020, uh, two and a half years, basically exactly after NTS, we have the first product of that shift. Okay. Take it away, Sersha, um, if you want. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, so, um, so, 
four seconds. They make long records, and this isn't such a long record. No, um, Ortega, of course. Uh, I've discovered them within the course of this podcast existing. I've since listened to as many of their albums as I can fit into my listening experience, starting with Confield, which I loved. Um, and I have uh, since found two of my favorites to be Tri Repetai and Oversteps. Um, which I think Amen, tell you quite, yeah, which I think it tell you quite a lot about what about this record I'm most likely to respond to. Um, just a warning: my review for this spoils two narrative stories. The first one is Blade Runner 2049, and the second one is I Have No Mouth and I Must Scream by Harlan Ellison. Um, huh. So um, I'm going to go track by track. And then try, t- and I think my review of the last track is a good closing paragraph for my uh, thoughts in general. So, M4 Lima, the first track, uh, starts with, with a noise like motorcycles revving up. Um, it's threatening, and it eventually explodes into almost Reznor and Ross scoring a first-person perspective of a psychotic episode. Um, uh, yeah, it really kicks off one minute and 45 seconds in with angelic synths over these chaotic beats. It begins to sound like the score from Akira, almost, uh, by Tsoma Ohashi, uh, who's writing pseudonymously as uh, Shoji Yoshim, uh, Yomishiro. Um, like Akira, or similarly synth-heavy, uh, the similarly synth-heavy Vangelis score for Blade Runner, what this feels like is, is driving through a neon-drenched dystopia, chaos happening all around you, Um, A riot, maybe, but you're safe and protected in your car, a passive observer of your own life. This feels like dreaming while you're cryogenically frozen. Um, Track two is F7, my favorite uh, major seventh chord. Um, Yeah, um, if... Yeah, this feels like... It's filtered through like what it's like to live through an ice age. It has Ortega's usual busyness, but it's uh, in the melodic experimentation, the way the arrangement of notes instead of beats creates a rhythmical offset uh, that I find the busyness in this song. Um, it leads to a more peaceful and eerie feeling, as um, th- that being the, the synth-led note-changing busyness as opposed to the beat-led busyness. Um, it's like uh, we are. Hmm. It's like we are, have become resigned to one final confrontation, which we know we will lose, and we have to say goodbye to all we love, knowing what we have to do. Track three, S I zero zero. This really reminded me of the William Gibson novel Neuromancer in a way. Uh, <laughs> it feels kind of cyberpunk if, with these very bouncing synth leads. It feels like I'm lost as a signal bouncing between television aerials, never stopping with this ever-increasing pulsating beat that gets more complicated while maintaining a fundamental instrumental simplicity. Um, a drone comes in over the song, and so at which point I feel like instead of bouncing around, um, I feel lost in space. Uh, like the end of the novel, I Have No Mouth and I Must Scream by Harlan Ellison. Um, at which point our protagonist has rebelled against the computer in which he lives and has been stripped of all senses and all sur- knowledge of his surroundings and he just drifts like uh, this, this thing through cyberspace. Um, it is one of the most horrifying endings to any novel I've ever read. Um, yep. But I find this uh, ending for the song, Transcendent. Um, Esk Desk, track four, which... Um, it's kind of obvious referring to the structure of the song as sort of escalating and then descending. Uh, esque desk. Um, yeah, it uh, slowly plateaus out at the end after a slow build of about three minutes. Um, it builds with uh, these very coarse synths that uh, feel like a rough sponge in a warm bath or sandpaper scratching off dead skin on your feet. Um, it's like the feeling Ooh, of good whiskey. I like that. That's, that's, and, that's amazing how well that works. The, the analogies here are like top Sand, shelf, Sir Chef. And paper scorching off dead skin on that's, your feet. That is exa- that's, somehow that's exactly how the synth sounds. And yep, I would have that's, never thought of that. That's, that's disgusting. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> my third simile is that it feels like good whiskey burning your gut as it goes down. Ooh. Um, yeah, good and feeling. It's a very good feeling. And then the melody comes in around three minutes and 40 seconds in, which uh, is, gives it a major key, uh, whereas before it was just sort of bouncing around the general uh, key and tonic um, and the rest of the scale. Um, and it gives it this real feeling of transitional bliss. Uh, you know, it's just really transcendent. Um, track five, AU14, 14th Orteca record. What? Um, this one has a slightly more classic Orteca sound. It has that busyness and pushing obtuseness of, of albums previous. Uh, for me, though, if you were slightly out of step with the rest of the record, um, clearly Orteca are more in the mind frame to create music that sounds more like what the rest of this record sounds like, in my opinion, listening to this song. More in the groove of making what the rest of the album sounds like at the moment. Um, uh, the, the pushing percussion uh, fills its role well. Um, it just feels like a strange spot on the record. That being said, the song is hardly bad. Um, the busy, uh, dr uh, driving, obfuscating synth leads are inventive and captivating. Um, and just every instrument fulfills its role well. I just, I feel like I love the rest of the record a bit more. Um, track six is Mataz Form 8. Um, the opening is almost funeralistic, and the sound of it still haunts me. Um, I'm going to move on from that sentence because I can't read my own handwriting. Um, I had to pause on 45 seconds in just, just to absorb what had just taken place. Um, because when this funeralistic chord progression happens and then the lead synths come in and gives it that melody that it has and that texture that it has, it, it is like someone who's just ha ha exploded a bomb of loveliness in front of my face and I, I have to sit there and just process my, my state of shock. Um, it's so evocative, so beautiful, in a, in a distinctly uh, cyberpunky album opening run um, those 45 seconds uh, feel like communing with nature. It feels like coming home. Um, metastasis, uh, which I was reminded by the title, Metasform 8, is a process by which a pathogen or cancer moves or spreads to a different part of your body. Um, in this song, you, you feel like an amoeba or virus without an eyes, ears or nose, pushing blindly through, through the dark, claustrophobic yet cavernous veins of your host. Um, I was reminded of the ending of uh, Perfect Sense, which I'm not going to spoil, but if you've seen that, that's what this made me feel like. I don't, um, um, I don't know if this is uh, particularly insightful or adds anything to your discussion, but someone to bring up the point that Matez Formate might be a reference to methyl formate, which I believe is the chemical name for formic acid. Oh, that's really interesting. I didn't know that. Um, yeah, no, I, I, I wasn't. I wasn't trying to say your takeaway intentionally. No, I was just trying to add another color to your title analysis thing. So, yeah, no, I'm. I'm hardly in that, uh, analyzing the title. It just reminded me of this process yeah. that I felt complemented the sound of the out of the, oh, totally. the the song. Totally. Um, to me, that yeah. song is like being dropped into a bath of clouds. That's a really good way to describe <laughs> it. <laughs> Yeah, you just, um, and, you just fall right through. Yeah. Yeah. And what, what I love about this track is that at points, these really beautiful synth leads will just jab in uh, for, for in and out for quite long stretches in between. Um, it, it, it feels like jabs of light in the darkness drawing you back into reality only to, to drop you again for long periods as when they uh, cut out. Um, it, and then the song ends with this visceral uncertainty. Uh, and I wrote in my notes one of the most pretentious thing I, things I've ever written. Um, it's like your soul's redemption is under review. Um, <laughs> that's uh, oh, I, I, that's so summoned such a perfect image into my mind. That's I love that. This is the kind of like vivid uh, descriptive shit I was hoping to hear today because like when you try because I try and go into like what the specific sound sounds like but I feel like with this artist you just it, you tend to give better reviews when you just like describe mm. the images the music gives you or, or like yeah yeah 
Because it's not like I can reference like lyrics that evoke a certain feeling. Yeah. Like they're um, just so... generally speaking, a lot of people when they try to describe this music, they kind of get too like mathematical with it. You know what I mean? Mm. And it just yep. it, you it just loses you. Like Zach mm. said, this thing about this record that it's Ortec's most human record, um, and I I feel that because you can't get intellectual about this record. You have to just talk about how it's making you feel. Because that's what, especially this album, I feel in some of Ortega's back catalogue, sets out to do, is it just sets out to put you in a space. And the only way you can really talk about it, if people are going to appreciate this album, is you say, A, are you receptive to this kind of music in general? And B, do you want to feel like what we're saying this album makes you feel like? Um, yeah, I, I just want to add really quickly, something I saw this morning, I read a, an interview, I read a review that quoted an interview snippet from Rob Brown, who said mm-hmm. that, um, who kind of re- was reflecting on the fact that over the decades, people had kind of accused Orteca's music of being uh, inhuman or uh, too robotic or too like emotionless, basically. And he's said, this has always kind of confused me. And I've kind of felt this criticism is kind of nonsensical because the issue for me has always been that I can feel it. Uh, so implying or suggesting that all of Orteco's music has been emotional, has emotional qualities to those to the artists that create it. So he, he ponders whether, you see, they kind of pondered whether their emotional, the communication of that emotion was too subtle for people to pick up on. And, and perhaps this is a response, this record is a response to that notion. Sure. Um, in a way that almost makes me feel though slightly, uh, plebeian to be like i got some of the most emotional response out of this record i have done out of other or tech records no no no, because that's that's the that seems to be the intention though for the record was to make something more emotionally direct right right i mean it does that i mean i find oversteps uh deeply deeply emotionally rewarding and satisfying um and something like confield which sets out to it gives you an emotion it's just a much more bleak emotion um when i was listening to it i felt like I was, it was pushing me to such a place where I was actually transcending into a different plane of emotional appreciation. Um, so I agree with, with what you're saying and what he's saying as well about their music. I also agree this is their most direct record I've heard for a while. Um, uh, so I just talked about Metaz Form 8. The next one is Schmuft 2. Um, which opens with uh, the industrial uh, glitches we expect from Orteca. Um, as opposed to AU14, though, uh, this feels more substantial in its Orteca throwbackiness. Um, I almost feel like this is... Tyler said that there's a track that he thinks is an active throwback to Confield. I'm going to place bets. It's this one. Um, best, <laughs> it's much better thought out uh, than AU14 tonally, in my opinion. It's better, traced on, better placed on the track listing, providing a bleak and spark, a bleak and sparse contrast to the rich expanses of the rest of the album. Um, GR4 um, has these staccato bass synths in the background. Uh, just to refer back to Blade Runner, which I mentioned earlier, um, this feels like a, a scene in Blade Runner 2049 where Kay might have just revealed a clue that upset everything he knows about reality. Um, and the leads, in contrast, I feel like the drive back afterwards with Joy there, where he realizes what he must do and he processes what's just happened. And together, they somehow feel like the scene um, where he sees uh, the, the huge advertisement of Joy bathed in purple, where she bends down and says, You look like a good Joe. And he's filled with grief and realization. Um, it is maybe not the most substantial or fleshed out track, but at a brisk three minutes, I'll allow that. And as I've said, it still brings about a huge amount of emotion within those three minutes. Uh, track nine is a particular highlight on the record for me. T Red A um, opens with a simple yet intricate and textural synth, building up a, a haunting melody. It's just so peaceful. Orteca makes some of the best use of empty space and stillness here. Yes, uh, the notes can feel repetitive, but the song rewards you with textural and melodic variation that create tone and, and sparse but intricate uh, flourishes 
um, that uh, that are added on that create a constantly varying texture. These intricate flourishes make this sound like Radiohead's national anthem on quaaludes, um, and just a particularly excellent use of. We're going to take the song at this pace, and you, if you adjust your expectations to that pace, it still rewards you with lots and lots of texture and experimentation and deviation. Um, and I think that's really impressive to commit to like that. Um, track 10, Spin, Put Sin, AM, has this driving kick sound in the background. Uh, Pissing in the oh. AM. <laughs> Pissing in the wind. Um, it has this driving kick sound with these cold and eerie metallic synth overlays. Every time you feel like it's going to fall into a satisfying and resolved melody, it wrong foots you. Even though it's repeating the same notes, the same four notes over and over again, you, you still feel like you're just expecting it to go back to the same thing, and then the 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 dissonant note comes in, and you're, you're wrong footed. Um, yeah, um, it wrong foots you um, in this uh, teasing cycle of repetition. Uh, it continues in this vein of. Uh, cold uh, sort of distance with the beat and kick drum giving the song its sense of cohesion uh, for six minutes and 20 seconds long um I, I would have liked a little bit more in terms of ideas on this song there's still a great ambient cut that if you just want to sit back and enjoy the tone of it for six minutes it fulfills that need um i just feel like it outstays it's welcome for me slightly when listening to it on a full album listen um and then the closer um, a cat's cast is now, I think, one of my favorite Orteca songs, full stop. Maybe not my favorite, but one of them. Um, Me too. Yeah. Um, it opens l like the opening up of the gaping chasm of eternal peace that is death. Um, it gives me chills. Um, the synth leads sound like someone's trumpeting an SOS signal in another language through the barrier between dimensions. Shimmering background sounds give the song not only its peace, but crushing bleakness. Two minutes and 10 seconds in, high-pitched um, harmonious drones, which is just a, a lovely idea by itself. Um, it signals the transcendence before uh, since it feel like a, a hug after a long and constructive emotional battle in which tears were shared come in. Um, it devolves into bassy squelches that sound like the album slowly retreating, retreating away as you slowly fall away from consciousness and into the inky black. Um, it's a perfect closer. It, um, uh, it's a perfect closer. It um, understands the end can be both a terrible but beautiful thing. Um, it, it understands that the because I, you know, the song feels like death to me in a way. It understands that death is inevitable and should not be feared. And while it's sad that not only life, but the album has to finish, it must happen. If the rest of the album has felt like K or Deckard or any Philip K. Dick character running from evil through a dystopian landscape, this is the end of Blade Runner 2049, in which K lays down to die, knowing he's had a good run and done good with his little time allotted and embracing finally having any peace in the inky black sleep of death. Wild how that's just like the best movie ever. Yeah. God, isn't it? Amazing. Also, that's also like the best review ever, Sersha. You you that was so beautifully put. Sersha, like, I'm just I, gonna I'm just gonna say right now, your review is better than mine. Oh no, <laughs> I'm so sorry. Not that my, not that I apologize for being good at your job. <laughs> not that I'm dissatisfied with what I wrote, but just that that really opened my eyes. And I've listened to this record like twenty times, and you just opened my eyes in a new way. Oh my God, I'm so happy to hear that. It was just when I sat down to listen to it to take notes on it. Just so many indecipherable emotions just clicked into place on that listen. Yeah, um, and I had to get it down. It was yeah. great. Yeah, I, I love this record. If you couldn't tell. Um, <laughs> I'm delighted to hear that. Um, Pass me by entirely. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay, let's uh, try and uh, keep moving. I would like to hear, if if he doesn't mind, I would like to hear from Morgan next on this record. Ah, yes. Uh, sure, I can, I can, I can do that. Um, 
it, it's not like I ever have heaps to say unless it's a Deftones album. <laughs> but uh, no, but I, you did get, you kind of did get into Orteker a little bit on my with my prompting. So I'm very curious your perspective. I did, I did. Um, oh, excuse me. Um, so yeah, I don't have a whole lot to say about this. Um, it's it's to me it's easily the most evocative thing that I've heard from the group. Um, <coughs> um, it's the most sort of emotionally outspoken. I would definitely disagree with the assessment that All Tickers music is cold and emotionless. Um, because if it was cold and emotionless, I wouldn't like it. Um, it's just really, it's about as simple as that. Um, there's just nothing I vibe with in music less than things that cause no emotion in me whatsoever. Um, so the fact that I've given like two or three of their records full marks, just, just destroyed with facts and logic. Um, <laughs> Yeah, this is the, to me. This is easily their most uh, emotional. It sounds to me less like a traditional. Not that there is a traditional Autechre album, but um, less like what you think of when you think Autechre, and more like the 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 score that they would make for a film were they asked to. Um, I feel like it's it's meant to conjure images and feelings in very similar ways. Um, the the Vangelis comparison is, I mean, it's, it's obvious, but doesn't make it any less true. Um, primarily, what came to mind was Blade Runner. Um, in terms of just pure sonic comparison, uh, but you know that just means that they're doing something new for them. And it also means that it's really, really, really good. Like really, really good. <laughs> I, uh, uh, what, I mean, I don't have words. It's just everybody. Neither else. do Autecker. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's like, oh, well, like a handful of Autigger songs that do have like uh, lyrics in some sense. Actually, Autigger do have lyrics. We auto-generated them. Oh, oh. Yeah, yeah we, we, there's this bot you can text, right? And it will like, you send the name of an artist and it will like send back to you auto-generated lyrics in that artist's style. Uh, and so August thought is a wise a sage as he is to text uh, Autigger and see what came up and do you want to reveal to our, our listeners i what, what i absolutely know? will yeah. so uh, the, these are the lyrics from autecker sign official lyrics right here sign official lyrics all right let's go i'm going to cry <laughs> because i'm so happy but i'm not really happy my friends say but i'm not really unhappy my friends say there's a lot of, th th I, I feel like it's, th there's the duality there of, is it really happy or I as in a qualifier for how happy you are or doubting the validity of this actual emotion? Many thoughts head full. So you fucking you, deep. You could also read <gasps> those lyrics as kind of like a meta commentary on the Orticker fan base who are like quite divided on this album, mm, to be honest. Indeed. Some of them, some of them. They are? Some of them think it's beautiful and wonderful, and other people are just like, eh, bring back the, the noisy stuff. Yeah, where, where are the hard-ass beats? Well, I think Bro, you got is, like 10 hours worth of that shit. What it is, is like uh, M4 Lima, the opening track, is kind of like a bit of a tease, because it does sound. It's kind of mm. following on from the sound of the 2010 stuff, and it's more heavier and kind of weirder. But then they kind of drop that for most of the rest of the record. So people kind of felt like it was a bit of a tease, I guess. But fuck it. Yeah. I, I, I like that track. I like the record. I, I thought I mean, that, that, was can, a, that was really funny. That was yeah. a funny way to bait the fan base. They, they, they can go cry about it. Yeah, yeah um, frankly. It seems the reception has been mostly pretty positive. Yeah. This is, this is currently the... Uh, I mean, I don't know how much this would mean because 
you know, NTS and LSEC both have 46 votes and 78 votes in, you know, criminal res respectively. And Tri Repite has 651. So, you know, yeah, I'm going to cheat. I'm going to cheat real quickly to see what the state is on, on rate your music. Take, Take a take this for whatever it's worth, but Sign is currently the lowest rated on Sputnik with a three point five. From how many ratings? Uh, fifty three right now. Okay, so on on Rate Your Music, Sign also has a three point five zero from uh, wow. sixteen hundred ratings. Um, oh, shit. Uh, but yeah, <laughs> I find this really funny. The compilations of of uh, of of LSEC and NTS. So LSEC has also 1600 ratings and a 3.67 and NTS has like 700, 800 ratings and a 4.0, which I just Oof. find really funny. But Woo. anyway, uh, that's a total aside. Yeah. Uh, um, I was saying things. I was please. saying things about how I don't have things to say. Um, <laughs> But yeah, I mean, more or less, this review is just going to be me pulling a Tyler on Deftones and saying, listen to my friends, they're right. <laughs> well, that, that well, actually means, that means a lot coming from yeah. you. Yeah, I can't wait to hear what Tyler has to say, TBH. All right, so uh, if we're going to move on, then I would like to hear from August next. Oh, no. Yeah. Okay, so uh, I guess I guess kind of by proxy of having heard the most albums, I'm kind of the second most well versed in Autecker. Yep. I've heard their first eleven, and their fourteenth. I I did skip out on the the four and eight hour ones. I think for the best, considering the time yeah. you were on. Yeah. But I did listen to this one a couple times myself, and I have uh, I have some some opinions. I of course, as has been mentioned, the sound of this record is incredibly fresh for the duo. I I interpret it as kind of more of a venture off into kind of progressive electronic sounds, almost more in the vein of like a uh, one of tricks point never per se. But I'll get more into that in like uh later i guess for now I'll just talk about the actual music itself like m4 lima kind of opens the album up on what seems to be kind of the standard note kind of for the band like uh kind of like in a sputtering engine starting up and then it transitions into this dense layers of like just shimmering electronics with incredibly minimal percussion, the closest thing you get here is like what sounds akin to like a rim shot on a drum, just very low key sounding beats. I mean, I think the, the haunting quality of the, the synths on this song as they kind of tear apart as you're listening to it, it's, it's beautiful. It's, uh, oof, yeah, it's just, immediately you're getting a taste of how different this album is going to be and i think i think for the most part that is really for the better because autekers albums have been getting longer and the longer obviously so for them to kind of strip things back and move in a whole new direction great career choice if i'm if uh yeah fully uh F7 kind of presents us with this flurry of electronics with like a noticeable just complete lack of percussion and it just speaks to just how radical this their sound is shifting away at this point. And like uh, SI00C00, however the hell it's called, <laughs> uh, it is kind of one of the tracks that really made me quantify the emotion at play on this album that for me kind of is the skeleton of sign that being happiness i think sign is a very happy bright sounding album uh i mean there's so many like the fuzzy distorted sense in the background of a 
C00. Uh, it's it's just a really incredible, incredibly distinct sense of playfulness, very reminiscent to their kind of early 2000s era with their very playful, energetic records like uh, Confield and Draft 7.30. And I mean, when I call those records playful, obviously that, that is very subjective, but I think that's once you look past kind of the gritty dark emotions present that's very much a part of those albums yeah i definitely see what you mean mm-hmm. yeah. people are like oh these records are so kind of esoteric and just like weird and you can't get into them and it's like what they are is they're anagrams of a dance album yeah yeah, yeah. i see that they're, they're just uh yeah but then you know you've got a Esk Desk, which I think is a uh, kind of kind of lower on the impact scale emotionally. I found uh, really a bit less. I I thought it was personally a bit less distinct and defined from the tracks that surround it. But and I think a lot of that, for me at least, is due to what I recognize as kind of the core structure of a lot of the way I noticed the songs on Sign to be built, focusing on a very central melody and then kind of deviating from that melody throughout the song, adding like weird noises on top of it. And uh, yeah, but AU14 kind of plays plays on a bit of the simpler side, having like a bunch of uh, rhythms occasionally disrupted and distorted by glitchier walls of, of sound. And, but the main rhythm staying kind of this constant, very constant uh, forward moving thing, which I think is a lot of what contributes to why I think this album in a sense sounds so happy and uplifting that, that we have many kind of sidetracks and deviations throughout this track, throughout these songs on this album, but something is always able to stay the same. Something is always able to persist and move you forward. Uh, Yeah. And then, uh, Kind of, but I mean, uh, AU14, I didn't find it as like exciting a a point on the track list, but still kind of what what was helping me unlock what this album truly was to me. So I I give it credit for that. Then Meta's Form 8's kind of sludgy, fuzzed out main melody with these kind of piano interruptions, I suppose. that that was what kind of started to unlock for me this aforementioned kind of central idea and focus behind the construction of the songs on this album. And I mean, this formula, if I, if I noticed it on a lot of other albums, I think it could, it could potentially be something that bothers me, but I feel Autechre is always able to present us with something that is so hypnotizing, so like and with there being such a brilliant sharp contrast between the main melodies and how they deviate and change that around i don't think it ever particularly gets boring and i'm always constantly just sucked into what's happening and then we've got the and i i guess i do find the run of uh food too through <laughs> p- s- n- a- m. Uh, I find it, I found that a tad underwhelming, just not not as exciting as I had found the first half to be, which is where I think this album's greatest strengths lie in its first half being for me the most consistently exciting, the most consistently interesting parts of this album. But I do find the closer are Kaz's uh, magnificent, just kind of wave after wave of distortion, lapping over the main melody like a like a vast ocean. Mm. And I mean, in summary, I, I do think this is a wonderful change of pace. 
for Autechre. I look forward to seeing how they build upon Sign. And I mean, I expect them to make something very similar that is, or maybe not very similar, but similar enough that is even better than this. Although one point is that I think it did remind me of a lot of their contemporaries in terms of the style. Like I think there's some Boards of Canada, some 106 Point Never on here, in a way that where I don't think it consistently feels distinctly Autechre, I think it, but I still think this album stands on its own as an Autechre album. A very fair review, I think. Um, definitely yeah. echoing some some criticisms that I've heard that I think are under, I think I understand, uh, even if I don't disagree, uh, agree with all of them. Um, hmm. No, awesome. that's, that's fair. Great, re- great all review right. as usual. Uh, all right, so that just leaves. No, I purposefully left Jake till uh, last before me because I think Jake's the only person this week who I haven't really like heard mention this album oh. at all. Um, so I'm quite curious to to hear. Uh, how Jake feels about this record? Well, uh, I guess the best way I can come into this is that the Autechre album that this most closely resembles, which I, I don't mean to come out of the gate making a comparison just because as Tyler beautifully put earlier that this I do feel like is sort of a a, a new step forward in a different direction. They sort of pushed their sound to their most large and and grand extremes in terms of length and now they are here to try something else and they do it is a very distinct feeling record but the autecker album it reminded me the most of was oversteps and oversteps is my favorite and the reason i say this is because there is a distinct effort to meld some more traditionally, I'd say, emblematic elements of Autechre sound and a bit more of a slower, dreamier, more, like, less focused on the, like, beats and how they hit you and more an enveloping way. Like, when I think of Confield, I think of, like, something very intimate and small. Like, I feel like a machine is pushing in on different parts of my brain when I listen to that. And when I listen to things like Oversteps, I feel there is a sweep, there is a grandeur about that sound that it does give you what you're looking for in terms of what you would expect occasionally, but it's more of an experiment. And I love that this is the way they have decided to progress that career because obviously since Oversteps is my favorite, I am happy with them going in this direction, but the similarities sort of end in what I would say is a matter of tone. I I feel that I can't really say too much that hasn't already been put by everybody else here because everybody did a really good job. Um, So, you know, being as holistic as I can possibly be is pretty much the best way to go about this. Um, But, I think that August's assessment of it being a much friendlier record and Sersha just sort of getting to the heart of the humanity and the inviting nature that it has. The word I would use to describe it, however, is warm. I feel like when I listen to something like Oversteps, there is a crystalline, shimmering, glittery, frigidness to that album and I love that about it it's like staring into a fucking prism of light that just keeps refracting in different ways and seeing all these fucking crazy things whereas this feels less angular it conjures up images in your head that are less definite when I listen to this it feels like I am having something swirl around me and and coat me and try to like I don't know an intimate experience that does not like assault you in kind of the way that something like Confield might and I think that's where the record shines best I think that uh despite it not being super in keeping with the rest of the record uh M4 Lima is maybe maybe 
be my favorite opening of an Autechre record, um, just because I feel it still gives you enough of what to expect from this record. It is kind of a, a, a sucker punch, which I think is a, it's not exactly a surprise that they would be like cheeky with something like that. So it doesn't exactly um, represent everything well, but that said, I just find it very sonically compelling. Uh, if I had to, you know, I'll probably echo a lot of, basically my thoughts are quite similar to August's. Um, there are moments where it still feels like old Autechre is bleeding through a little bit too strong, uh, specifically on AU-14, which I would not at all be surprised if they called this AU-14 purely because they knew it sounded like their old shit. Uh, it's not exactly like a, a callback or a throwback or anything. It's just something that feels a bit more divorced from the consistency of before. But that said, I think when you get into things like uh, Metaz Form 8, when you get to GR4, and uh, I, I always said the ninth track is Thread A, but I don't know if that's correct or not. It's an um, anagram of the word Thread. Okay, perfect. Uh, so there is something new here, though, that's just they... Is it Rob and Sean? Is that yeah. those, those are their names? That they have clearly gone to an extra effort to stay within their field, but elaborate. And what this record does to me that's better than anything that I can engage with it, like on a personal level, is that it really just makes me excited for the fact that these guys are so restless and the fact that they are gearing their new direction of sound, one that more appeals to me, I'm very excited and happy about that. I don't mean to diminish Sign just because it's not like what I would consider a perfect record or even a perfect uh, emblem of what they're trying to accomplish now. I think it is a bit inconsistent and I do think that the record does have moments um, specifically on the back half where sort of the repetition that comes along with a lot of these cycling, skittering, more traditional mechanical parts of these songs that just kind of repeat to a point where I find it to be unfriendly in a way that the rest of the album is not. I think this is a great introduction point to people who want to get into this because it is like the complete opposite of confrontational. It is so easy to digest and just sort of feel on a very pure, very sonic level. I would say it's somewhere between Amber and Oversteps in that aspect. Not that I am an expert or anything on this band. Uh, but there is just like it is a great album in many ways, but I am mainly excited because it shows room to grow. They are not one trick ponies. They are clearly still doing weird shit. I don't remember where I, I read this. Uh, it might've been something that you sent um, like in the chat or something, but that like this record, or maybe it was another record, but this album was made through like just file sharing. And just like, it takes like a really long time for them to sort of, get into the groove of what the songs actually end up being until like the very end. And I think it's like remarkable. It's a testament to their process that they can do something like that and just still feel like they create a unified vision. Um, it's a very easy album to listen to. Uh, it, it's repetition is it's Achilles heel on occasion, but it's always for just fleeting moments. It's never enough to knock it down a significant peg. I enjoy listening to it a lot. I think that the hour and 10 minutes is a bit long, and I know that it's shorter compared to everything else that they've, they've done and been doing, but this album had a solid 10 minutes shaved off of it. I think I would consider this as being a top shelf member of their discography. Um, that said, I do really, really really like it. I really enjoy it. Um, there is lots to love here, and it's clearly... It, it, I can see why it's splitting the Autechre fan base, I, I suppose, just because if you think that Oversteps is more of a, a, a sidestep rather than a step forward, then I can't imagine that you would feel all that differently here. But, I don't you know, know it's you an emotional... intentionally, Jake, but you just, like, verbatim said something I said about that record in my Worst to Best video. 
I probably like it's probably stuck <laughs> in my subconscious because that's that just makes like I registered that, that. Makes me happy at all. Well, it registered <laughs> like I registered your words on Oversteps so strongly because that was the one that I was just like, I know this one is going to be my shit. And yeah. if you would like, if this album was out, I have no doubt you probably would have recommended this one too. Um, I can't obviously I do not feel as prepared to tackle it as you and there is certainly room for this to grow on me um but, but I, again when you're not doing a track by track thing I really risk the whole like I might come off as a bit vague I don't like that I'm tired but yeah. uh, I never complained when I had to put this on I it didn't really test my patience in the same way that LP5 did and it didn't sound dated it's a really interesting cutting edge sound and i just i just think it's neat and i enjoy <laughs> it i'm glad to hear that and that's a very fair review i think i want to say as well like for probably the first few times i listened to this i felt very similarly uh basically exactly how you feel and it's really only in the last few days and, and specifically in the process of getting my thoughts down into words um specifically that the album really started to open up for me, uh, which is not a guarantee that it will do that for people who feel the way that you feel. Um, but certainly I think um, my relationship with this album is now kind of integrally tied to that process of unpacking it. Because uh, mm. if, I had, if I did not have the chance to do that and I had to kind of just talk about this uh, off the cuff, uh, I would probably feel considerably less positive than I do. Um, so that's an interesting part of my process, I guess. Uh, really breaking it down actually opened it up for me, like paying attention in terms of trying to describe what each song was doing. So I'll do that now. Um, yeah. Uh, and also another comment I'll make just uh, to comment on, I think you talked about kind of the recording process uh, and file sharing and, and specifically how uh, Rob and Sean operate is that they actually live in different parts of the UK are completely different uh, cities. So uh, they do not work uh, in the same space when they create music. What they do is that they, they have the exact same kind of software and technology and, and programming that they use for it, for their respective uh, gear. So they're working with the same gear, but they work independently and they send uh, material to each other. And one person will kind of remix the something that someone else sent them uh, et cetera, et cetera. And so the process eventually becomes collaborative in that sense uh, until eventually the distinction between what's Rob and what's Sean on a given album uh, is just not there because it, it becomes so integrated. Um, and often uh, I believe that they've commented in an in interview, someone will send something to the other person and it will be basically identical to something that the other person has already just done completely independently. So <laughs> their brains are like super in sync after working together for 30 years. Um, but that said, they kind of gee, do. I wonder, have... Sorry. sorry. If gee, I wonder what that's like. <laughs> As yeah. Tyler, Morgan and I this very week have been slowly morphing into the same fucking person. Yeah, no, but like, imagine well, it's, it's been an with... in-joke between the five of us for years before we started doing this podcast that we thought the same things at the same time. That's one thing though, but imagine like working with a, a sort of technology and software as complex as the stuff they've used to make the, rec the re their records for the last, for the best part of the last 20 years. A record like mm -hmm. XI, for example, imagine working with that software independently and just happening to create something identical to the other person yeah, without true. working with them on it. It's um, like they're more than married. Yeah, basically. Yeah. Uh, and and yeah and so they and they kind of also have sort of distinct they're very similar but they also kind of have their own sort of personalities as well like rob is a little bit more uh introspective and shy and withdrawn he tends to say less in interviews than sean who's much more who's kind of the more hyper of the duo um uh the and one who's uh, smoking a cigarette and more i was about to off. ask is that is that one sean because that yes. looks like a sean yeah, that, that is Sean. So, so it's actually quite interesting, um, the dynamic that they have. Anyway, that's, that's really an aside. Uh, because, it, well, well, one thing that was kind of getting uh, hypothesized um, on kind of like music boards online was that, because uh, they hinted about earlier this year, they hinted that they were going to release two albums. Uh, and they didn't really say anything more than that. Uh, and so people started kind of... Um, uh, 
uh, guessing, hypothesizing that one would be like, they would be like solo records and one would be a Rob album and one would be a Sean album. And I think that's kind of bullshit, to be honest, because I don't think they would do something like that. Or if they did, no. it wouldn't be Orteker. Um, But this certainly feels like um, more of a Rob album, Lisa. if I had to pick one of the two. Lisa, you come down for dinner, please? Yeah, Lisa. <laughs> um, yeah, little asshole. Anyway, <laughs> that all said, I'll now get into my review. Um, so Sign is not an ambient album in the strictest sense, but it does strip back the percussive element of their music and to a lesser extent at points, even the rhythmic focus altogether, which is jarring. I know that the record that comes up in terms of comparisons um, to other Ortega albums and Jake's already made it is Oversteps, but even that is, is, an, is a poor comparison because that record really, when you kind of sit down with it, is a, a much more percussive and driving and at times even quite aggressive album, uh, even though it does have plenty of the spaciousness. And, and to me, that what that record is like is like uh, being in an idling space station and occasionally going through an asteroid shower. Um, but anyway, uh, yeah, but, but that kind of rhythmic focus that kind of, start, that kind of reoccurs throughout that record is, is much less present here. Uh, to me, the album, if I had to make an Orteker, another Orteker album comparison, which I honestly hate, but it's also kind of fun, so why not? Mm. If I had to, uh, the one I would compare it to is Amber, um, in terms of the, I guess, the presence of the sounds, if that makes any sense. But at the same time, Amber is a very 90s album, and this is a very modern sounding record. Like, it, it, you don't need me to say that this record sounds great like it just sounds amazing if you've got headphones on it's like it's like treating yourself putting this record on uh, massaging like, your brain it's you like what? rewarding your ears for... what most closely came to mind for me was amber but even then amber is way more percussive than this yeah certainly definitely uh it's this is kind of more like some of the more ambient tracks on amber like yulquin or something but anyway done with the orteco comparisons uh I think I may, I may have a, a small number, but, but let's move past that. Um, there are still tracks here that pulse and clatter with forward motion, most notably M4 Lima, AU14 and Schmift 2 um, or Scheme Fed 2. Uh, and then you have other tracks that uh, have more muted and simple percussive lines, such as Pissin AM, um, which I still am going to keep calling Pissin in the AM. Um, <laughs> but for That's the most shame. part, Every other track here is driven entirely by the synth pads and tones themselves, uh, which are as texturally rich, gorgeous, and unique as ever, but more inviting, uh, warm, emotive, uh, whereas in the past the duo have sought to complicate and subvert their typical effect. Uh, here it's kind of like almost disarming in how unguarded uh, many of the tracks feel. Uh, you almost kind of listen to it and you're waiting for something fucked up to happen, and it just generally doesn't um so that yeah like i said that is disarming uh when you approach this uh having being familiar with their previous work uh m4 lima the opening track uh is as i've already said the clearest link to the previous era uh, it glitches and surges through cavernous spaces with violent clashing tones and much the same way that material on nts and elsec was wont to do um, for about two minutes, it seems as though Rob and Sean's MO has really not shifted from those records at all, until quite gloriously you get these gigantic and gorgeous melodic pads that ripple into the track. And then the frenetic chaos of the opening section sort of reshapes itself into a more focused rhythmic backdrop. Um, it's a bit of a bait and switch, to be honest, but it, it serves as a brilliant and striking transition to the new, more pared back sound they have begin, begun to adopt for this era, it seems. Um, it has a formless quality to, cer to certain familiar sounds, and what that does, I think, is recontextualizes those sounds to this new, more measured style. Uh, and, and what's so great about that is that it links this new era, era to the previous one while setting the stage for this album. I don't think this is a, uh, a track that sounds out of place on the record. I actually think that it sort of introduces you to the rest of it quite nicely. Um, 
But just to take a, a step back for a minute, what sign feels like more than anything is a, is a purposeful wiping of the slate, a, a settling. Uh, it does not necessarily feel like the full arrival of a new sound, uh, just as oversteps at the beginning of the previous decade didn't feel like a full arrival uh, once you heard what followed it. But what it does feel like, as oversteps did, is a fulsome declaration of purpose and an introduction to an expansive palette that will be used in exciting new ways. Uh, it also feels like Rob and Sean are attempting to welcome back the audiences who dropped away after their material went more long form and demanding. Uh, it is the duo refusing to be pigeonholed as the makers of difficult, laborious music that holds audiences at a distance, while at the same time not feeling like a concession either. This is not Ortega kind of going pop in any sense that an IBM act could. Uh, to me, the greatest attraction to their music, which is the textural richness of it and the sonic density, are both still present here uh, in spades. Uh, the former across every track and the latter across the album as a whole. Um, the duo often choosing not to pack individual tracks with dense mixes, but allowing the kind of holistic project to serve as a kind of broad sectioned canvas for varied exercises in painting with sound. The brush strokes are always the same, but it is the interaction of new colors and new perspectives that make this a truly significant step forward. Uh, F7 is like a spiritual sequel to the Baroque melodrama of the Oversteps highlight known one. Uh, that track's clear and staccato melody is here malformed and melted into a series of bleeding tones that blur together at points uh, and surge in a frenzy of descending melodic progressions. Uh, it is more minimal only in the strictest of senses. The tones are not necessarily clashing like they would in an earlier Orteker piece, as they are just brushing together violently. Uh, and the feeling that is evoked here, uh, especially through that low descending melody that serves as the song's bedrock, is that of panic and disorientation. Uh, I find F7 to be a claustrophobic and even heartbreaking piece of music that moves me more with each listen. And, and that kind of is a good point, I think, to comment on the emotional quality of the record. Uh, certainly, we've all established that we, for the most part, feel this is a more directly emotional ortecker. But I found trying to pinpoint the, uh, the, the general emotional tone of the album is really tough. Like, at the moment, I think, because it's definitely most of the time I've kind of leaned towards August's perspective of, of this is a more happier ortecker. But then I hear a track like F7 or Eskdesk, which both to me sound very dark and sad and, and pained. Uh, and it complicates that. And, and I think that is what I, attracts me and, and evokes such a distinct emotional responses in me from Ortega's music is that they don't really stick to a singular emotional tone. They often sort of... Uh, traverse the emotional spectrum, or they'll make something that alternately sounds two different contradictory emotions at the same time. Uh, and I think a good example of that on this record is Ark Has to the Closer, which we'll get to eventually. Um, and and Sersh has actually already touched beautifully on how there is a kind of emotional contradiction there. Um, Thank you. Uh, that I, yeah, I couldn't say better than she did. Um, but yeah, F7 I think is just is just seriously one of the most upset sounding Orteker songs ever. Um, and I, I find it quite moving, to be honest. Um, SI00 uh, sees the duo introducing bubblier, friendlier tones, and it's underlined by a steady and throbbing beat. Uh, I, I'm sure that I know this word has already been used to describe this track, but it is very playful. Uh, it is almost childlike, I think, in the sheer brightness of it. Uh, and the way it teases a number of different melodic progressions with each iteration. No, no, none of, no single iteration of that melody is exactly the same. And what that reminds me of is their early seminal track, Flutter, uh, which from the anti-EP, which does the same thing. It, it, it utilizes repetition, but each repetition is slightly shifted and changed in some way. So it's actually not repetition at all, even though it has the appearance of it. 
Uh, and that is such a cool thing when Orteca do that. They also do that later on the album as well, and I'll get to that track as well. But, but yeah, first time you hear uh, SI00, it's like, okay, this is quite cool and playful and, and fun, and it's repeating this kind of interesting motif. But then you kind of listen to it, and you realize, oh, actually, they're kind of switching up that rhythm each time it plays. I just love that shit, you know? It's just, it, it's a key to kind of unlocking the detail that makes all of their music so rich, including this record. Um, but then about two and a half minutes into this track, the tone of it changes completely with one simple addition. And what that is, is this bass heavy stretching tone that arrives suddenly to add a sense of menace and doom to the track. You had this playful melodic bubbling and now this tone comes on the top of it and it starts to feel like it's trying to evade something. Uh, it's, it's like it, initially it feels like a school of fish kind of just swimming around the ocean you know, together, and then that bass tone comes in, and it's like suddenly they're swimming away from a shark that's trying to eat them. I just love that. <laughs> um, yeah, awesome, awesome track. Uh, I, I, and again, a perfect example of how the duo can use simple changes in the mix, quite simple changes, to completely shift the emotive center of a track. Uh, Esk Desk follows on from this by dropping the more tactile core of the previous track and returning to a similar state as F7. This track is all just brushing melodic pads that collide and wash together like a turbulent oceanic storm. Um, so it's like SI00, you're under the ocean, you're in this kind of, it's a very aquatic track, SI00, I think. It, 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 someone described it as like, uh, I don't play video games, but someone described it as like a Mario water level or something. <laughs> Super, Super Mario 64's water level is definitely what they were thinking of. Yeah. And wait, yes, wait, they are correct. Wait, which song? SI00, the third song. Right, yeah, okay, okay. So it's like that song, you're under the water in this kind of colourful uh, world, and then in Esk Desk, it's like you've gone above the surface of this colourful world, and there's this storm happening, and it's like lightning, and and someone, I read a review that described, I think, described, I'm not sure if it was this track, but I think it might have been, described this track as like lightning without thunder, um, and, and I liked that quite a bit. Um, so yeah, it has this stormy quality. Uh, once again, the, uh, the emotion evoked on this track on Esk Desk is one of ominous dread. Uh, and I think it's quite affecting for its simplicity or the seeming simplicity of it anyway. It's so easy, I think, to get swept up in that core melody at the center of the track and not also notice the way that uh, Rob and Sean also play with dissonance and fragmentation on this song. That again, the piece is actually constantly shifting, though it seems stable. And this contrast feeds into the sense of paranoia evoked here quite masterfully. If you just look at the chord progressions of the song and, and, and think of it, you don't have to know anything about theory, but just think about how each chord combination makes you feel. And you'll realize that it's going, that the feeling is going from like satisfying to dissonant, uh, haunting to terrifying to calm, almost at random. Um, but yet it doesn't sound like a random song. So it's like, wow, like you, it just that kind of, that kind of shit is pure or ticker. And anyone who says that they've kind of simplified their sound too much or, or it's too two dimensional now, is just fucking full of shit. When you hear a track like this, that is pure ambience, but it's beautiful collisions of chords that are so rich and, 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 and compacted. Uh, I love that. Um, AU14. So I've heard a bit of, uh, not hate, not dislike, but I've heard a bit of criticism for this track so far. Interesting that this is one of the ones that people feel a little bit, uh, certainly it does sort of, whoa, okay, it's a hard beat on this track. It has the <laughs> hardest beat of the album. It is an absolutely hammering, insistent and unrelenting pulse. Like if you just like listen to the tactility of it, it genuinely feels like someone is sh striking your head with a hammer. Um, and it's tactile and raw. Um, and, and actually, what that beat reminds me of is the track Sea Fern on the album Confield has a very similar quality to it. Uh, and not only that, there are also, in this track, there are these kind of inconsistent washes of colorful noise. I really don't know how to describe it other than that. They kind of hang over top of the track and they kind of bleed into it at certain points but aren't constant. Um, and what they are is they are identical 
to uh, sounds that appear in another track on Confield called Sim Gishel. Um, and so uh, the combination of these track the, of that kind of colorful noise and the throbbing beat, two elements which both recall Confield, to me, uh, means that this track kind of seems to serve as a modernized and comparatively more minimal and driving tribute to that album. Um, the melody in this track is more buried. There definitely is still a melody, but it's kind of like the, the rhythm is, is uh, holding it down um, against its will and it's kind of trying to seep up, but the beat is just hammering it. And it's certainly coming after the sort of stretch before it and immediately after it, it does kind of feel a wee bit jarring but I really love the track. And I think it also is a, is a really great piece of sequencing to put it at this point in the record, to be honest. Uh, the, the, most, the, the aggressiveness of this track makes the forlorn quality of the next track feel even more devastating, I think. It's like this is some kind of violent attack and then the next track, Mateus Formate, is like the, the grief-stricken, devastating aftermath of that attack. Uh, and I find that piece of back-to-back -back sequencing really effective um yeah and like i said the melody in au14 is buried so it's like uh your ears are searching for a sound to focus on but the process of searching for that melody to focus on is means you get absolutely battered by everything on top of it uh it feels like your brain getting a workout and i think that that quality of difficulty where you're kind of searching for the melody because that's just what we search for when we listen to music, but you have to fight through the heaviness. I think perhaps that's that particular quality maybe rubs some people the wrong way because it's, it's, you know, it's not pleasant the first few times you experience it, but I do quite enjoy, I quite love this track to be perfectly honest. Um, I, if anything, I wish there were maybe one more track like it on the record at some point. Uh, Mateus Form 8, wow, <laughs> uh, it is one of the most emotionally devastating pieces, I think, that Rob and Sean have released ever. Uh, it sounds, to me anyway, cold, defeated, alone, where basically every track before it on the album sounded warm. Uh, but it, it frightened at points, even desperate. Here there's a resignation to this track and it shakes me to the core. And I think it taps into something deep in my brain, a kind of repressed feeling of hopelessness that I don't like to confront, but to some extent is kind of simmering there every day of my life. Um, that Robin Sean can evoke that purely through the collisions of beatless pads. Uh, it's truly a mark of how practiced and professional they are as artists. Um, it may seem simple, but that kind of, the kind of quality they get across on this is not something that someone who has been making music for a short amount of time could, could be possibly capable of doing. Um, it's, it, it's, a, it's a beautiful tribute to how far they've come in understanding how effective emotional tone can be through some com when uh, when evoked through simplistic means, um, and it's another point as well that I can bring up. A lot of people certainly there is complexity and busyness and density and uh, difficulty in the music they've done in the past ten years before Sign, but each project at, at certain points, some more frequently than others, does kind of pair things back to make to make something more emotionally direct. Like you think about Blade Laws on XI, for example, or um, Easter on LSEC or EO on NTS. Like there are always, it's not like they re re have consistently rejected simplicity. It's always there. It's just that people kind of, it doesn't get the attention maybe that some of the more off the wall stuff gets. And here it feels like this record is allowing that particular aspect that softer side of them to get a spotlight and I, I, re I really love that it's something I've been kind of waiting for to be honest um, yeah like I said um, the decades of work and refinement that have made them such a singular and attractive musical voice are just really perfectly on display with a track like this Mateus Formate um, then you, so moving into the second half of the record, which has been a little bit more contentious, and I'll kind of want to hope, hopefully unpack that a little bit. Uh, it is less immediately rewarding than the first half. 
And my first few experiences with this record, I have to say, I was underwhelmed as well with some of the material on the second half. Uh, and I still now, I don't think this is a perfect album and the stuff that I like the least is present on the second half. But uh, I do find that I love most of the second half just as much as the first half. Um, uh, Schmift 2 uh, or Skin Fed 2 or or skimf d2 whatever you want to say uh it's immediately more uh elusive and amelodic than anything on the first half of the record it's more of a textural exercise uh and it's quite uh off-putting in a sense um because uh the focal point of the track is either buried or it's just kind of constantly shifting um the one consistent element in this track is the beat, which is actually fairly straightforward. And if anything, I think I would have liked for the percussive element in this track to be a little less regular and to incorporate more shifts and variations. Cause that's what everything else is doing on the track. Like all the uh, other textures are kind of like changing and shifting and kind of doing crazy shit. Whereas the beat is very steady and sometimes that works in their music, but here it kind of feels a bit off. Um, as it, it basically what this track sounds like is beautiful collisions of sound set to a metronome that is kind of squelchy, but it's still ultimately a metronome. Um, and that's still very good, but it's just not quite at the level of everything that precedes it and some of the stuff that follows it as well. Um, however, uh, GR4, uh, the shortest track here, uh, is an absolute masterclass. Maybe easy to overlook because it is quite short and because of how it doesn't quite have a center in the same way as some of the earlier stuff has. But oh, this, this one's a grower, man. Uh, it basically does a similar thing to that previous track. It's collisions of these varied and disparate tones. But what it does is it actually removes the percussive element altogether. Um, so you get a pure, more kind of swirling and enveloping experience. It's easier to get lost in, in a positive way. Uh, you really do get kind of caught up in the fuzzy waves of beautiful sound here. Uh, and it retains those shining and buzzing surfaces that give them such a kind of tactile and unusual feel. Uh, that synth tactility ultimately, I think, is um, that kind of quality of how it, when you listen to the synth sounds on this record, it feels like you could reach out and touch them and they would be solid. Uh, I think that quality is... Uh, the greatest individual element of sign as an album. Um, it's the dominant characteristic of the palette and the production across most of the songs here. And it really, I think, adds a lot of character and emotion to the record. Uh, and I've listened to a lot of electronic music and it's seldom do you hear synths that do sound that way. They often sound like liquidy and soft and uh, pretty, whereas here, they do really sound like they have a rough edge to them, but they're beautiful at the same time. It's a very uh, novel sound for a synth, I think. And it, it just, it's, oh, it's like ear candy, man. Um, yeah. Say that two more times. Candy man, candy man. <laughs> candy man, yes. Yes. Uh, now I want to give a special shout out. Um, as, as Saoirse already did, but I don't know if anyone else has really mentioned this track in detail. Um, oh, I think Jake did, but I want to, I want to really unpack it because this, I think is what the th red, uh, or thread. <laughs> it's definitely th meant to be said thread. I think some people are saying the red a, and I'm just like, <laughs> no, no, that's the worst one yet. Um, yeah. Uh, wonky angle. Um, anyway. Wanky angle, more like. Yeah, the the chunky oh, I, ankle. Um, I hate anyway. being alive. Um. Anyway, I want to highlight this track because this is the most. Uh, this is the track that has changed the most for me uh, through, throughout, like spending time with this album. It's the one of the most minimal tracks here. Uh, in in many ways, it's kind of like a more deconstructive execution of a track like GR Four or F Seven. Uh, here, the duo utilize silence and space to highlight an individual synth tone and a repeated melody. And they derive emotion 
not just from the progression of the melody itself, but from the way that they vary and manipulate the textural surface of the tones. Now, note, the tones themselves never shift or disappear, but the way they feel does. In fact, the way they feel is constantly changing in this song. Like on SI00, where that central bubbling melody constantly changed ever slightly in its progression, calling back to Flutter. Here, the duo do the same thing, except they're not doing it with melody, they're doing it with texture. And the shifts in texture with each kind of repetition of that melody are much more subtle. Uh, they really necessitate good headphones or a good sound system to fully appreciate, I think. But this is one of the most rewarding tracks on the album in the sense that initially it might seem too simple, too unchanging, like it did for me the first time I heard it. But once you really try to pin down the details of it, you realize this motherfucker is a beast of detail. And then you kind of get lost in the detail. But eventually, and this is where the length of the track is key, I think, because you start focusing, first of all, the track is six and a half minutes long. First of all, you're focusing on the sound and that melody for the first minute or so. Then you start realizing because of what they're doing, they're changing the texture of it so much. So you start focusing on those textural changes as the song goes on. And then after a while, you come back to that melody. And I don't know what it is because the melody never changes. And I've kind of broken this track down on my own time, try to figure out what this is. But somehow, without ever changing the melody, it just becomes more emotional as it goes on. And I don't really know why that is, except for the textural stuff. That's where I think that the, and by textural stuff, if it's not clear what I mean, it's the, the, the quality of the sound of it. Um, like sometimes it might be, a, the repetition might be a bit softer. Sometimes it might be a bit harsher. Sometimes it might be lathered in a bit of noise. Sometimes the noise might be stroked back from this central kind of like four or five note repetition. Um, and, yeah, it's that, that textural stuff. No repetition is exactly the same texturally. And that, I think, is ultimately, you're getting lost in it, and ultimately, it just, the, the melody starts hitting you harder and harder towards the end of the track, or it does for me anyway. And when you get back to that melody, you realize how affecting it is, how fragile it sounds. Um, there's a, and, and that is necessary. You kind of have to dig into the track to uncover that, because... The, the tones themselves are fulsome and heavy and it kind of overwhelms that fragility or disguises it. Um, but kind of once you move past it, you see the fragility that's there in the melody and it's really beautiful, I think. I don't know if any of that made sense, but, but I, to me, in a, in a lot of ways, this kind of track is, is the key to unlocking the album. I got you, man. You did a good job, I think. Um, okay, penultimate track. Peace in, peace in the AM, piss in the AM, uh, most <laughs> clearly evokes, uh, I'm not the first to make this comparison, uh, if you're into IDM, it's actually probably an obvious comparison, but Ortega have brought it on themselves, it sounds very similar to the early Boards of Canada track, Everything You Do is a Balloon, um, it is perhaps, I think, the least effective piece on this album, though I do like it quite a bit, uh, it lingers in repetitive minimalism for a very long time. Uh, it sounds gorgeous. Once again, it evokes that isolating, lonesome quality that hangs a lot, a lot across of this record. Hangs across a lot of this record. Uh, if there's any track on the record besides the, I've already kind of talked about how F7 sounds kind of similar to Known One from Oversteps, but this track more in terms of its approach is the one that most resembles that record i think um it's look i don't have a lot to say about this one it is a track that is nearly quite good on an album that is great so i uh, look i'm not mad at it uh i just don't have a lot to say for it um yeah and to be perfectly honest uh, i think this album would be better if it were taken out and replaced with the bonus track uh which i'm going to talk about in a minute as well it's very good. Yeah. Anyway, closer. Our cast. Oh my god. Um, <laughs> yes. It is, it is the best track on this album. Not for lack of competition, but it's like, it just is. Uh, and it is one of the greatest tracks they have 
ever released. Um, Autica have put out uh, probably close to 300 individual tracks, and this is in my top 10. Uh, the pads ripple across the track here, as they have throughout the album, but they have a distorted and longing quality that makes them feel like they are fighting to exist. They emerge from a deep, bassy bedrock, like they are thrashing for air in the mix, and they continue to do so throughout the track. And the lack of conventional development from that point, from that template, is what makes it so affecting. Those tones never seem to quite reach a point of comfort, a point of stasis, a point of calm. You get these absolutely fucking gorgeous twinkling counter melodies as well which almost seem to be commiserating with the synths in their struggle and when i close my eyes and listen to them it's like i'm drifting in the sea in the middle of the night looking up at the stars uh it has that purely kind of imagistic quality that all of the best or stuff has another cool detail at the end of this track is you get the kind of in the mix you get this gentle i didn't even hear this until about the 10th time i listened to it um but you get these gentle really gentle intrusion of these beeps and what they are is they're sampling the beeps of a traffic crossing um you know when you're standing waiting to walk and it's like beep 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 and i so, for some reason i didn't hear it the first bunch of times i heard it now i listen to the track and it's like yeah they're clearly there um uh, and to me, to get a little bit uh, reading into that, because they're definitely obviously there for a purpose, because uh, Rob and Sean have in incorporated found sounds into their music before, but they don't do it very often. Um, so I ha it has to mean something. So it's like, and what it is, and it's just the, the beeps that play when you're not supposed to walk. They don't sample the progression that beep, 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 beep that plays when you are supposed to walk. So that's got to mean something, right? So to me, it's like you have these static bleeps that are signifying stop. Uh, and what they're doing is they're intruding against an endless horizon of constant sound, like a desert. And I'm struck by the thought that that clash between something static and something longing um, has to mean something. Uh, and it seems to me to symbolize a conflict between stasis and progression. Perhaps you could even infer a meta element to it and say that what it is is Rob and Sean commenting on their own feelings about where they are at in this juncture of their career, waiting to cross to a new side, but being swept up in an ocean that is pulling them back to the past. Once again, it calls back to their opening track, M4 Lima, which itself seemed to be the sound of a new era wrangling itself free from the shackles of the past. So perhaps this album is just transitional. Perhaps wherever Orteca are going is still miles away yet, or perhaps they will never get there. But they are certainly not stopping yet. The movement is as constant as the destination is distant. And this is just a sign of things to come. It was so good. <laughs> I, oh. I, I see what you did there. <laughs> I, 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 I debated good. I debated whether I should include that last sentence, but I did. And you did. Oh, <laughs> God. oh Jesus. Yeah. Uh, maybe, that maybe didn't work don't. out as well as I anticipated. Jack, maybe what don't. Have what have you done? Wait, I mean, we had a nosebleed within minutes of each other. Wait, really? <sighs> uh -huh. It's just Ortega's power. No, I think this just goes back to our earliest, earlier mentioned one brain cell theory. Eventually, this podcast is just going to be one screen. And it's yeah, going to be always... all of our faces melded together, speaking in unison like a, <laughs> a fun, demon. A fun um, podcast law fact is um, in like the first year of Jake and I knowing each other, um, we would constantly tell David Lynch to fuck off because <laughs> we would do this shit all the time. Uh, which I think is very funny. No, Absolute crazy. mad lads over here. No yep. wonder he terminated your friendship if you were telling him to fuck off all the time. That's just such a, a mean thing to say to a friend. I'm just where I'm going with that. I don't know. Anyway. Yeah. Well, 
Yeah. What was that about? Favorite tracks um, and ratings. Yeah, let's, let's do our favorite tracks and ratings. Um, Jake, we'll go in a normal order. Jake, you go first. Okay. My favorite tracks are M4 Lima, uh, Metaz Form 8, and uh, say Thread A. Uh, least favorite track. In another new way of saying that song. We've had about five different ways to pronounce that song <laughs> title so far. I mean, I said Thread A the first time. Oh, did you? Okay. Yeah. Sorry. I, I uh, and then. Shut up! <laughs> My least favorite is. Not going to tell him to fuck off. You shut up too. And I give there was it a, a call back. I, I give sign a 7.5. Sick. Out of There's a word that you can make by changing only two letters in sign. What if we Sing. become? <laughs> Sing what if, what if by my chemical romance? What if I shoot myself in the forehead? Anyways, my. What's your race? I don't know. Let's find out. <laughs> okay, one sec. I'll get the gun. Anyways, August favorite. first. No. Favorite tracks. Okay, fine. I'll do my favorite tracks and rating first. Uh, R Cats. Uh, F. Uh, fucking the first one. F Seven. Lima. Lima. Four M Lima. That's it. And uh, F Seven. Least favorite. Uh, I might say. Piss in the AM. And rating is. Seven. Shit. I'll turn this back around. <laughs> yeah, 75 out of 10. Bold from August. <laughs> 7.5 out of 10. Sick. Gorgeous. Two, two 7.5s in a row. Okay, Morgan. Uh, my three favorites are uh, R. Kazd, um, M4 Lima, and uh, probably F7. Uh, least favorite, I'm um, probably... Are either Schmiff de two or piss in the AM and uh, <laughs> sign more like nine out of Fuck ten. Yes. Fuck oh, yes. Oh yes. I didn't. Go. I didn't. I didn't. I didn't mean to say that like Christopher Walken, but it kind of turned into that. Nine out of nine. ten. Nine. Wow. Out of wow. ten. <laughs> Let's oh jizz. Oh my god. So that's me Let's then. Go. Sure. My favorite tracks were C U, um, Threads, the 1984 British film. Um, Portis and, had tight beat. And uh, <laughs> and Ur Cats, the, the musical. Nope. Um, Stop. No, nope. No more. Band. Cuche no more. I draw the line here. This far. <laughs> no no father. father. Wait, what's that from? Star uh, an Trek. episode of Star Trek The Next Generation. Which I haven't seen, but this gets a 9 out of 10. My Damn. baby. <laughs> I would like to see the baby. I should have... Um, I sh I've still got the plastic on it. I should have taken it off so I could have like shown you the gatefold. But yeah, yeah, it looks stupid. <laughs> looks all stupid and shiny. Do you know what doesn't look stupid? Whatever Jake's rating, it, whatever Tyler's rating is, which I want to hear. Uh, so, uh, well, oh, man. Yeah. my rating probably won't be too surprising. What is difficult is picking <laughs> three favorite tracks. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to go, well, obviously Arkhazd is my favorite because I already said it's one of the 10 best songs Ortugu ever made out of 300. Um, uh, also going to shout out... Um, the red A or the red redder or the <laughs> red da or I'm gonna stop there. Um, mm -hmm. You are. Uh, and the third song I will shout out is uh, on Matez format. I can't not shout Matez format out. Um, oh, and so. My least favorite track is, uh, as I think I already made clear, pissing in the AM. Uh, a rare miss. But it, who knows? I, I, I could love it in a week's time. Who fucking knows? Uh, and the album gets 9 out of 10. Oh, yeah. So... Yes. Okay, so that gets an 8.4 out of 10. Ooh. For, I'll for reference. LP... Which, which she deserves. 
honestly. For reference, LP5 got a 7.8 on average from us. Oh, and in what terms, I, sorry, no, please continue. I I just, um, in terms of comparable ratings, Everything Everything's Reanimator got an 8.2. So all of the Tyler records are really like right what I, here. What I should do is reveal where this album falls in my Ortega rankings. Yes, oh, you should. That. You know what's I funny know about that is that I actually... Mine. Yeah, and we can. I want to hear August too. What's funny about that is that I haven't actually decided yet, but I'm going to decide right now. Okay, so our second album uh, on the slate today uh, is Open Mike Eagles Anime Trauma and Divorce. Um, Jake. I will probably introduce Mr. Open Mike Eagle. Please do. Uh, Michael Eagle, uh, born in Chicago, Illinois, but based in Los Angeles, California, rapper. Um, very oddly prolific artist. He is involved in very many projects other than his own solo work, um, stuff like Bus Driver. He's in a collective called Project Bloat. Uh, and he's a member of Thirsty Fish, Swim Team, and Kavanaugh, which are all just sort of collections of different, like, eclectic musicians and sort of a pioneer of the modern and self-coined art rap label, uh, which is sort of a more, I think, just grassroots approach to making beats and music. He is always rooted in a relatability with his lyrics he is a he's frank honest but never without humor and now we have anime trauma and divorce his most recent record following off of the very acclaimed uh widely celebrated brick body kids still daydream uh pretty like that album rose like i mean that was pretty popular when it came out sort of a um uh, autobiographical album in a lot of ways, talking about his childhood, uh, where he lived as a, a kid with his grandparents. Um, and now we have an album that instead of looking back, looks a bit forward with his current state of affairs. And that's pretty much it. Uh, I am, I guess I'll just sort of rattle off what I have to say just because this is not a super difficult album to talk about. And I just do it just from the, just from the vibe I'm getting, I have a feeling that I'm probably the only person who has any strong feelings on this album. Um, and I like it a lot. In fact, I think this is one of the uh, better hip hop releases this year. Um, certainly up there amongst my favorites. I think that this is a, very compact album that does not outstay its welcome at a lean 34 minutes, but also does not feel like a lesser project in a way. It has Mike dealing with a lot of internal turmoil, uh, a lot of stuff having to do with his work on uh, work with Cartoon Network and Adult Swim falling out, um, just some personal drama he went through um, with some of the people that he's worked with over the years and some of the collectives that he's been in and just sort of coming to terms with that, as well as, of course, as the sort of title implies, the imploding of his marriage. And it's interesting just because I think that Mike is a guy who, like, you'd think that all of this happening would be cause to make this, like, really big sort of emotional statement and like he would distill himself into all this but like he does really change his approach and just sort of makes this a very accessible release i think in a lot of ways the production on it i think is fantastic pretty much just like everything else he's ever made it has sort of a more rickety appeal than most modern hip-hop but that is just sort of its charm uh, that said, I think this harkens back to dark comedy a lot. A lot of the beats here are very lush, very dreamy. Um, some songs on here just straight up sound really contemplative. Um, a lot uh, songs like um, The Edge of New Clothes, uh, Everything Ends Last Year. Um, and it just includes a lot of content that, like, this does sort of unfortunately belong to the 
difficult pantheon of albums we're covering this year that is just like the state of the world because it inherently ties to how Mike is doing, except it's not like, it's a little less overbearing than other projects uh, that we've covered. But that being said, I do not think I have been hit more hard and more bluntly than I was uh, on, I think it's um, Everything Ends Last Year, where the utterly defeated occasional refrain of, it's October and I'm tired, yeah. comes through. And I just remembered hearing that and just stopping dead in my tracks at work and being like, <sighs> me too, man. That's a that's a cold mirror to look into. Yeah, well, and luckily not, the, not a um, black mirror. <laughs> well, that's that is referenced here. the The divorce yeah, in that, question, that my point. <laughs> I think, is uh, one of the more interesting things that he talks about on this record, just because it's uh, like the least prevalent thing bothering him. And I think, in a way, that lets him sort of explore himself in a very compelling sort of meta narrative he's got going on here but it does lead to one of my favorite songs on the album which is the black mirror episode which is this whole record sort of has this sort of like this up and down kind of flow to it but once we hit the black mirror episode there's sort of a descent that we come to where you have mike's very animated performance of the Black Mirror episode ruined my marriage. And there's these like sour horns in the background that are just blaring. And he's going like really hard with his flow on this, talking about how he and his wife at the time watched an episode of Black Mirror that sort of opened something up to them that eventually led to the implosion of their marriage. And there is just something so raw in the way that he talks about all of this. You can tell that he is both deflecting the blame um, that he would otherwise lay on himself onto this TV show, but also he is just sort of being like, the fucking world is, th like, th everything is so fucking crazy. How could something like this not happen? And he's talking about suddenly having to find a new apartment and having to go through all this shit just because he saw a fucking bad episode of TV that struck a chord with him because he got too many, or he watched too many episodes of the toys that made us. Um, th this is a very, um, Do very right online. Do the right on the shelf. Yes, it, it's a very um, online TM album filled with lots of things that are just very modern. I think um, uh, What the Fuck is Self Care is a very good um, example, example of this, um, where Mike is doing his best to understand what he needs to do to deal with all of the shit that he's been talking about. And it's one of the few records I've listened to this year that sort of deals with the trauma and stress of everything happening in a way that feels like the person going through all of this is going to make it out okay on the other side, which, good Lord, I just need that in a year where we're also inundated with things like Ultimate Success Today, or even to a lesser extent, the new Clipping album. Both albums I really like, but I just like to have a little bit of light at the end of the tunnel. I can't fucking, sorry, this is a complete aside. I'll be very mm. brief. I can't fucking wait to review Clipping. Oh no, oh, absolutely. And the, Ashley and David Diggs and um, Open Mike Eagle are good friends. They were promoting each other's album just last week. Um, this album also, as the name uh, implies, has lots of references to anime. And Indeed. I will, Indeed. yeah, August and I briefly discussed talking about some of the references here. And I think the most important to just, I will throw out there just for the sake of everyone else's context that like, I will elaborate upon a little bit further just because I think you like, anyone with a cursory knowledge of what he's talking about can kind of like get it. That said, there are two very frequent references he keeps going back to. It's not like a huge wide variety, but the two properties yeah, yeah. that Obviously. Mike goes back to are Jojo's Bizarre Adventure and Evangelion. Yeah, yeah, of course. And very oh, broke everything. Oh dear. Um, but it was a cute dog, adorable dog. <laughs> and 
I think these are two comparisons that like I'm August and I haven't talked about this yet, but I'm sure he'll kind of back me up here in that Mike is clearly somebody who is rapping from the standpoint of a bit more of an everyman. He is less a persona and more his real self. And also like on records like um, Dark Comedy, we alluded to talking about songs like Qualifiers, Tyler. The reason Qualifiers is debatably his best song is because that is a complete top to bottom reconstruction of a um like a, a brag rap song it's a song about him gassing himself up but in a very classy coat of paint like qualifiers are the things that make him better he says respect my qualifiers and this is sort of the approach that he's coming at this album with too but he does it with a bit more self-awareness and the important thing to remember here is that the two properties mentioned jojo's bizarre adventure and evangelion are two things that through the course of their creation were basically fluid they were not stories that stayed being about the same thing they are stories that have a very definitive arc not in terms of what happens in them but in the way their creators affected them and evangelion that is basically a descent into the psychological turmoil of a depressive episode that uh, Hideki Anno was going through. And in it, he channels a lot of himself into Shinji, who is referenced on this album, including the, the second song, which is subtitle or sort of parenthetical with Idiot Shinji, not the only reference to him on here. Yeah, but he's, he clearly views himself as being... Shinji in many ways, and Shinji is sort of a character who is meant to embody all of the things about youth and immaturity, uh, puberty, all of these things that represent like, just like burgeoning of one's identity and self-esteem. He's basically a complete fucking wreck of a human being. But what's interesting is how that compares to how he keeps referring to Jojo's Bizarre Adventure, which is a story that starts out being something that was very much of its time, something that was built upon um, the landscape of anime and manga at the time, which was all about mimicking 80s action movies, American action movies. They wanted their heroes to be people like Arnold Schwarzenegger in fucking Commando. That's why you got people like Kenshiro from Fist of the North Star. And as JoJo's went along and we got new developments of new characters, the creator made these characters more multifaceted and complicated, but also more feminine, more uh, just more interesting. His art style evolved and it became something that was beloved because of how it evolved and influenced like, yeah. everything else. What, one really important aspect about the evolution of the art in JoJo's, I think, is that a lot of it is that uh, a lot of what... Uh, uh, Ah, uh, boy, his name is escaping Tetsuro me. Tetsuro It's not Tetsuro. What's his name? Fucking... Hirohiko Araki. Hirohiko Araki, that's it. Uh, a lot of what, what I think is important about that is what uh, his present-day reference materials mainly consist of, like, articles from Vogue magazine and anatomy mm -hmm. books. Like, things that are very, very natural, very inherently, like stripped back and meant to give you a just clear picture of what a human body looks like. And I think that's, that kind of can be tied into the album itself. Yes, I think on I'm a Joe Star specifically, he, where he does allude to getting to be the main character of his own show. And I think that Mike's back and forth between reconciling with the childish part of himself and the part of himself that has evolved as sort of Joe Star is sort of the central conflict of the record, which is oh, and also Sweatpants Spider Man is yes. a good example of body image on here. Yes, he very much sees himself as someone who is like starting to let himself go a little bit, and he's trying to like recapture the sort of physicality through this, and it's never done in like this overt way or this like intellectual way it's very skillfully woven in with just an enjoyable very solid release that he's going through but i think it's definitely intentional here that he is going through a 
crisis as a lot of these songs sound contemplative like what the fuck is self-care is literally a character arc in a song of him realizing how these things are supposed to help him he starts out talking about what these things do like aesthetically like things like kelp cubes and his shakes and like just going on walks he gets it on a cursory level but then he's like no these things are doing things that I that my body needs and that I need to take care of myself which and, and then at the end where he's like um and, and, and when I realized this I pulled out all my dreads and the beat just ends yes. it's yes like chilling yeah, he's like clearly he's he's gone through something and also it's just there is a a tangible sense of him struggling but also just sort of him laughing at himself never taking himself entirely too seriously and getting mired in the potential misery that one might do which i think is what makes this such a breezy enjoyable listen his flows are constantly switching up which i also think is just more inherent just because of the fluidity of the record he's constantly going at things from new angles which it's not something new for him he does that often but i still find him to be a much more compelling mc than even he was on dark comedy which he could be a little flat at sometimes here he's switching things up um i think the beats are a little bit more interesting i love how slow some of them are there's just one of them that evokes this imagery of just sitting on the edge of a cliff and staring into the sky as the world goes on around you and i'm just like god i cannot think of a better way to make me empathize with someone who is living in the year 2020 and I also like that he's, uh, he incorporates uh, his son a couple times on here, most notably the closing track, but also in one of the chorus refrains on an earlier song, just sort of reminding that he is, you know, a parent with responsibility, but he's also having fun with his son. And it's just, it's very charming and it's very, it's very cute. And I am, I am a big fan of that. And overall, I just think this is a very solid project. There's a lot going for it that doesn't overshoot its ambition, but also knows exactly what it is. And I think if what you want is like, I want a new Open Mic Eagle record that is just more rooted in him in the present moment, you will walk away satisfied as I have. And I, I, I really enjoy it. I have listened to it multiple times um, and it's probably going to land relatively high on my albums of the year list. Uh, I, I think it is one of his better records. Okay. Um, well, unless anyone has a burning desire to go next, I'd like to leap on that, if that's okay. So, I'll take that as a no. No one has burning desire. Nope. Okay. I have a um, burning desire to leap on you. Wow. Damn. Real um, horny hours in the Jams and Tea if, podcast. If we're getting horny. Uh, we do it in, in like in person when we're here. <laughs> um, okay, so open my Eagle, Adam H. Children Divorce. Um, and my Eagle has been on my radar for a really fucking long time. Even as the music pleb I was a year ago, to a degree. I, that's harsh, but you know what I mean. Um, his brand of witty. Um, mellow hip hop with um, real sharp insight has always really appealed to me on albums like Dark Comedy and the one I referenced in Trick Body Kids uh, Still Daydream. Thank you. Um, yeah, uh, those are two albums that have meant a lot to me getting into hip hop. Um, I, I feel like this album, um, I like it. I will preface this by saying I like it, but it is an album that feels like. Mr. Mike Eagle, we, 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 we're stuck in lockdown uh, and, and was more or less throwing whatever came to him at a wall and following that through to its logical conclusion than um, actually making a coherent record. Um, like songs like <laughs> Headass um, featuring Video Dave. Um, as much as that is a very fun, entertaining, goofy song, it feels like a, a riff more than a really good old Mike Eagle song. Um, it feels like something was like, wouldn't it be funny if I did that? Let's just do that because I'm stuck inside and I can. Um, 
this is a, a pandemic record in the sense that uh, Laura Jane Grace's last song the record is a pandemic record in that it, it feels like a bunch of ideas you come up with stuck inside you can't think about anything and you just want to get something down on paper without having this the, the structured record of a more professional recording um for example i can't think of another record that would feature his very annoying child twice um that would be made not in these circumstances um I mean, like, in fairness, I, I also find the child annoying, but I, I don't think necessarily the child, the child, that sounds so fucking like a, like a fucking uh, doctor. Um, we're in a Herzog and the Mandalorian. The child. Um, I, I do also, not I, want to hear the baby. I, I don't <laughs> think that, 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 that little Ace, I think, is, is, is his rap name. I don't think he's here... Just because, oh, this is a quarantine album. No, 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 no. It's no, no, very no. obviously and, clearly... And the quarantine thing is more than service that this record feels in many ways, frequently, like an indulgence. Well, um, I, I want to... We... I get where you're coming from. I want to, like, minorly disagree because I think that... Uh, I mean, first of all, this is a record about 2019, not 2020, and I'm not saying you didn't say that, but that's an important thing to establish. The worst year... The year referred to in the song title... Um, everything ends last year is last year um no, but course, specifically course, i think course. that this album even if 2020 hadn't been the way it's been with the pandemic and all that i think this album would basically be very similar uh, if not the same right i mean if this came out outside of 2020 and what's going on and my understanding based upon my engagement with what artists are saying how artists are recording music at the moment um, if this came out in 2019 without the pandemic, I would almost be more like I would be less able to rationalize the the deviations from what I from what I really respond to about Mike's music um, because at least now I, I have sort of a context about how this kind of album could be conceived, um, sure. and I still think the record's good. I never said different. Um, Mike's music is witty intelligent, acerbic, creative. Um, his production is always is immaculate. Um, and it's just a very imaginative record. Um, I suppose if this came out in 2019, I would just see it as a more self-indulgent, more inconsistent open mic eagle project with less of the substance of his best work. Um, that being like something like what the fuck is self-care it feels like a riff upon a single idea that i could understand happening when you're stuck inside all the time <laughs> like you're discussing over this idea what the uh, fuck <laughs> wait so, you said that no i didn't say anything i just i was racing on my mouse pad to hit the mute button before i sneezed and i failed in my <laughs> <laughs> i should say so indeed <laughs> but with the song like what the fuck is self-care that is a moment where the variations upon a single theme really pays off. In fact, that's something that my favorite band, The Mountain Goats, they do a lot in their early work. Um, something like Riches and Wonders or The Mess Inside on my favorite album are just lyrics that are variations upon a singular theme. And those are some of the best songs ever written. Um, and I'm not saying the song reaches those heights, but it hits a similar moment of like the variations are always satisfying and build something new upon the central narrative of the song. Um, I'm a Joe star bracket black power fantasy where uh, Mr. Mike imagines himself as a, as a Jojo's bizarre adventure character. Um, I find slightly grating. Um, I find the closer 15, 20 feet ocean now. Nah. If this had been recorded in a studio with a professional rapper supporting, it might have been a six out of 10 song. As it is, it feels like the worst of indulgences where, where I get that you love your son, but like Chance a rapper rapping about how much he loved his wife didn't save the big day. Um, it was also like the 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 last thing wrong with it. Yeah, no, I was 
point taken. Point taken. Um, I want to talk about Bukarati featuring Carrie Fu. That is a fantastic song, in my opinion. And I think Carrie Fou, Fu, whatever French for false is, um, I think she lends a wonderfully uh, calm presence of mind, having uh, chill presence. I think her feature on that song is one of the best things about an already very well produced, very well written, and brutally honest song. Um, uh, Death Parade has a very chill vibe and flow um, and some very imaginative lyrics. I remember very little about it. Um, oh, that's like a best song on the album. Yeah. <laughs> I ha- m- most of my notes are very complimentary. I just remember very little about it. I guess the um, thing that I'm co- sort of confused about is I don't really see how the album's that indulgent. I yeah, mean, it's indulgent really? in the same way that art is indulgent and you want to talk about yourself. I, I don't see how it's any more indulgent than Brick Body Kids Still Daydream or Dark Comedy. Oh, believe me, Jake, like those... I'm, I'm preparing to, to counter Sersha's perspective when she's that, that's, that's fair enough. I, just, I feel like those records are more very coherent and focused records that are about um, something very central it's driving at, uh, whereas something like th- these records feel more like riffs that have been blown up into songs um like riffs upon an idea a central idea i suppose and sometimes it works more than others because mike is a very talented man and can make these singular sort of riffs upon an idea very fleshed out um but i don't think that is always the case is i suppose what i mean um and i would have preferred a more focused record um with less uh, it feels like a frivolous record more than anything else. But I want to stop criticizing myself. It's not like the Black Mirror episode. I appreciate what you're saying about the song in your review. All the time I've listened to it, it has just seemed like a, a gimmick more than anything else. Mm-hmm. Um, Everything Ends Last Year is a masterpiece of a song. I fucking love this song so much. Uh, when he says, it's October and I'm tired. I'm at a place in my life right now where due to COVID, and I imagine this is due to different circumstances for Mike, as is hinted about in the record, but for me, due to COVID in my life has fallen apart in myriad ways. And ever since, um, before COVID happened, I'd been struggling against a lot in 2020. The third year of my degree was, was hell for many reasons that I'm not going to get into here, but it is now October and I've spent the whole of 2020 being embattled. And in many ways, all I've wanted since I was 16 is just my life to settle down into something that I can just get on with. And now it's October in 2020 and it's just not happening. And I'm so tired. fucking tired. Um... And I, I just want to be able to sit in my bed and, and just sleep for a year until it's over and I have my energy back. So when Open Mike Eagle gets on the song, he says in the most ASMR, intimate, beautiful vocal, the vocal mixing is so perfect. He just says, it's October and I'm tired. It's his delivery. The words and the texture and timbre and the, the delivery of the words just captures my mental state at the moment in such a perfect way. God, do I love this song. Uh, Sweatpants Spider-Man, I love as well. Um, yeah. Uh, Sweatpants Spider-Man perfectly uh, encapsulates a feeling um, of, of, of growing up and finding finding out who you are after you've grown up and now that you're older, you, you've come out of the very involving battle that is being young and now you have to see who you are after you've fought all of those wars um aesop's bop featuring little ace um as much as like this kid off i think the actual composition and writing of his hook with the strange key changes in the middle of each chorus is very well done and i think the song surrounding that is also very well written um that being said, I find some of the jokes about pronouncing Evangelion slightly tedious. Um, but I think the melody writing and the beats are very, very good. 
Uh, again, what the fuck is self-care? It is the best version that a, of itself that a song like that can be, and it reaches the heights of some of his best work. Even though other records following a similar structure and approach to songwriting fall quite, not quite, fall more flat for me on this record. Um, yeah, like I'm a Joe Star, and the closer is just very tedious. It's a good record, but I would love to see what he does next time more. Okay, I just, I'll just follow up because my review is not very long, but I feel slightly different to you in a way that's interesting. I think um, I do think this is a record that does feel a little bit slight um, in the sense that uh, it feels. I don't want to say rushed because that's not what I mean, but it does feel a little bit like. Uh, it's 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 a little bit too short for one for starters, but it feels a little bit like I don't know. I just wanted a bit more from it. Uh, it just kind of feels of underdeveloped, I think, in places. Yeah. But I think it is conceptually very unified. Uh, I think it is a purposeful record in terms of what it is going for. I think it captures um, uh, Mike's state quite well uh, and and meaningfully. And one thing that um, I know. Uh, none of you have overlooked, but has not, has not, I feel, quite yet been given its due. Um, and perhaps the irreverent tone of the record means it's not quite as immediately noticeable, but Mike has bars on the album. Yes, he does. I mean, he always has bars. I think yes. it's worth shouting out the fact, uh, listening to his records this week, I was struck by what a technically talented and just an awesome writer Mike is, and performer as well. There's so many bars on this record that are just genuinely funny, but not like uh, just casual offhand attempts at humor. Like it's very much kind of like has the quality of like a stand-up album in the same sense yes. that Danny Brown's last album did as well. Yeah, but it's very pointed. similar vibes to that one. And you know, I feel like I feel like I could see similar criticisms being leveraged at that record that I would also disagree with in that instance. Um, perhaps it's a little, it's a little uh, less substantive than what we might expect in terms of the follow-up to a record like Brick Body Kit Still Daydream. But it's, uh, I think it's clearly a necessary sidestep for Mike with how uh, turbulent his life has been recently and how much of an upheaval uh, there's been. Uh, to me, I do think uh, uh, this record would not sound differently if the pandemic hadn't happened, it doesn't, it, I don't see it as a quarantine record at all um, or a record that is a product of the quarantine, really. I just think that uh, the way Mike's life was going, that was just a, an unhappy real world analog to his suffering that just happened to happen. Um, but that certainly doesn't mean that any criticisms of it that Saoirse made are, are unfair because, like you said, if it came out last year and sounded like this, you'd feel the same way, if not more critical. Um, but I just think that it's it is very tempting to apply the label of quarantine record to something that sounds like this and comes along at this time, but I just don't think that's what it is. I think it's just a, an emotionally... Um, introspective record in the same sense that a lot of quarantine art has been but but not for that reason um uh yeah i, I think there's like like i said i'm coming at it in terms of a little bit being uh, a, a defender here but i do think it is not close to being one of his best records in terms of as a whole um that said death parade opening track is just one of mike's best songs uh yeah he's, his, he has this thing where he just can consistently crushes the opening tracks and um i love the the vocal delivery on this track i love the flow i love the way that he kind of details this kind of cycle of, of familial breakdown the way we kind of hurt that parents and parents kind of hurt each other hurt their children their children grow up to hurt their partners and their children and and mike communicates this in a way that's quite uh not too pointed but it is also very direct um uh, I love that 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 refrain, that hook of um, uh, we took a bad fall, we had nothing to land on. She reached out and put her hands on me, but then we knew we had the math wrong. Um, yeah. That's quite a uh, that's kind of like a summary statement for the divorce aspect of this record, and yeah, and it's uh, it's quite good, it's quite affecting. Um, um, yeah, so that's an amazing song. I think um, where am I? 
uh hit ass i think is a cool song a little more irreverent i like the strings in that track i think they're a real nice yeah. touch to the second half of that track uh and i want to shout out there's a few different production credits across this album but that track was produced by black milk who's a very great and, and seminal producer and, and does an awesome job on it um i do think the combo of sweatpants spider-man and bukiarati are both too meandering for their own good um, though I will say I think the latter track has the emotional potency of the best stuff. It just really outstays its welcome. It's a four-minute track, and really there's only so many times I can hear a carry foe repeat, broken the zip again, over and over and over on this song. And I get that's the kind of point of it, but it's just really irritating. I'm not going to lie. I want to cave my head in with a rock. Um, but it's not like it's a bad song. It's just an element of the song I don't care for. She has a great verse, though, on the song, I will say. Yes, she does. Uh, fantastic flow. It's not, it's not a bad song. There's just a part of it that makes me wish I was not alive. <laughs> <laughs> I, just, I, just, I listened to this record four or five times because it's quite short. And I will say the last couple of times, I just have to hit skip it when I get to about halfway through the song. Um, uh, yeah, I don't particularly care for most of Ace's bop. Um, <laughs> mainly because I think it's a bit silly, especially with the inclusion of Lil Ace. God bless him. Um, uh, that said, Mike does have a few good lines on this track. There's a breeders reference um, in this song, which is this, I, I did not did not expect that. Yeah, there's actually quite a few cool cultural references on this on this album as well that I was oh, yeah. not expecting. That I kind of dig, um, like indie sort of references. But another indie reference on Edge of New Clothes is when he says, um, "I cover up a landslide, Pisces Iscariot." That was, um, I think I actually had to like rewind the track to just be like, is that really what he said? No, that, that that was... I, I laughed out loud when I heard that. <laughs> it's so funny. Um, cause that, this, that song is like one of the heavier songs on the record. About, like the, the yeah. chorus is just like, I'm lying on the edge of a cliff and I, I'm not afraid of anything. And he's just, I love and, Love, He's just able that. to temper that darkness with, with a stupid Smashing Pumpkins reference that actually comments on the darkness. Um, yeah. so that's, I'm, like a, I'm like a living Smashing Pumpkins reference. So that, I mean, yeah. Yeah, uh, so that was fun. That's one of my favorite songs on the album, incidentally. Yeah, it might um, be my favorite. Uh, but back to Ace's Bop, I do want to shout out the beat and production on Ace's Bop is super good. Love it. Thank you, Frank Leone, who produced that song, and also Joe Star, I think, production on both those songs mm. is top tier. Um, yeah, like I said, two of the best songs on the record are front to back. Edge of New Clothes has a tense darkness to it. It has a doomy beat and a flow that... Oh, there's a quality to the flow here that is almost unhinged at certain points from like mm -hmm. Feels very um, untethered from... I don't want to say untethered from sanity. That's maybe a bit too far, but it feels like he's... You know, Stability. Going, yeah, he's going through it. Um, and then Everything Ends Last Year is, is one of the most fragile and affecting tracks on this record. Yeah. Um, it's October and I'm Tyler. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's, <laughs> he really thought he did something right I'm, there. I'm so disappointed. <laughs> <laughs> I only said that because some people have said that one lyric so many times in this, in this review so far, but it is a good line. October um, and you're fired. I'm not, I'm not taking responsibility for that. Nobody else should take responsibility for that either. Um, Black Mirror episode is hilarious. I think, again, this is a track where the irreverence of this, the concept, first few times you hear it, you might think, okay, this is kind of novelty, fun, I get what he's doing. And you might overlook, again, how just great, really funny and, and awesome the writing is on the song. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's a really great song. Let me just bring the lyrics up here. Um, it, it, it's just, a, it's a song that like, I feel like if you've ever had something inconsequential, just absolutely like spiral into something stupid, you just be like, oh God, I know exactly what he's fucking talking about. And it um, sucks. Yeah. And I like, I like the way that it sort of like unpacks the fact that like, man, if our marriage was undone by an episode of an anthology sci-fi show, this wasn't going to last. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. It, it perhaps does strike a nerve with me as well, because I've had those kind of experiences in, in previous relationships where you're watching something and it kind of just like, you both sort of realize that, um, you know, it's commenting on something that you have not spoken about. 
but it's yep. just, you can feel it there. Um, but there are so many great lines in this track. I uh, thought it would be another Lost in Space. Now I have now to. Now I gotta go fight my own damn place. <laughs> um, that's really funny. Um, what's uh, another one? <laughs> uh, uh, just the whole second, I think it's the second verse. If I was petty, I would try it as a court case. The goddamn episode raised the divorce rate. Um, <laughs> uh, sh- should have picked something else, anything else. Do the right thing, Blu-ray on the shelf or the bootleg tape of Will Ferrell and Alf because now I have to live with my goddamn self. <laughs> Just really uh, th- there's stuff. also one where he remarks as like to seeing like he sees them them in a black mirror and i was just like that is that is ba- like a fantastic way of pulling that all together <laughs> oh Big yeah brain. Yeah, Big brain. Brain. yeah had a good Big home and we had good trust saw a black mirror and it looked like us good line um, oh yeah uh also just love the repeated uh refrain of uh shit should have come with a content warning shit should have come with a content warning <laughs> that- I laugh my ass and off he's, every time. He is so like angry, like actually yeah. like pissed when he says that too. He's just like, shit should have come with a content warning. And I'm this just is, like This is yeah. one of his angrier records, and I, I pray that yeah. Charlie Brooker never meets him. I just, would whoop his ass. Yeah. <laughs> Deservedly. Yeah, I mean I saw a Crocodile kill him. <laughs> I yeah. saw the latest season of Black Mirror. Sorry I about that for I you. I did not. <laughs> yeah, no thanks. <laughs> You're lucky. Um, yeah, Morgan and I watched the second to last one, and there's a video of us watching all of it on this channel. <gasps> Let's Some that. of those opinions don't hold up. No. The good um, ones specifically. But yeah. <laughs> Black, <laughs> Black Mirror episode. All of your opinions are good opinions, Morgan. Black Mirror uh, I, meant the, I meant the positive ones. I, I know it was a joke. I want to say okay. Black Black Mirror episode is a legitimately great song, and I think just because it's funny does not make it slight or or you know it's like I don't know I, I feel I feel for Mike in a sense, especially because this is a follow up to a record that is quite socially serious. Yeah, uh, and it's like I feel for him because he clearly does not want to be pigeonholed as this kind of like conscious rapper all the time. Yeah. He wants to be able to show that he has different shades. He, he and, says that on dark comedy. He's just like, if another dude calls me a racist, I'm a snap. And he talks about just like being pigeonholed and not fucking oh. wanting that because he wants to talk about whatever. Uh, there's a great line on that album uh, where it's like, um, I can't, it, I, the exact wording of it is crucial and I can't remember it, but it's like, um, you know, if I hear one more white person telling me I can't, uh, I can't rap about. Oh, uh, something about, uh, Fuck you if you're a white man who assumes I speak for black folks. Um, fuck you if you're a white man if you assume I can't speak for black folks. That's it. That's it, yeah. That was an amazing line. Genius yeah. bar. Um, but yeah, anyway, so it's like, I feel from like being in this position of having to having this, uh, we're like the, the records that get the more clout and the more uh, critical esteem and more respect yeah. are the ones that tackle conscious shit. And, and records like this are just like, they're not taken as seriously because they're frivolous. And it's like, it's a shame because it's difficult. It means that there's a, an ad, added layer of difficulty when it comes to making a record like this in terms of being taken yeah. seriously. And I admire... And he clearly wants to balance himself. Yeah. I, I, that said, I do think that it's a bit less successful than a similar exercise like uh, You Know What I'm Saying, just because it doesn't feel quite like as full as it could be. I know I'm not talking about changing any aspect of most of the songs here. I just think that it needs to be a little more fleshed out. Um, that said, good album. I like it a, quite a bit. Um, but yeah, I just, it's just lacking that X factor, I think, that something like Dark Comedy does have. Yeah, Dark Comedy is still his best, if you ask me. But yeah. He also just don't miss. All of his records are good. <laughs> oh, and, and I don't need to say this, but the closer is just dreadful. And uh, yeah, the kid, I have to stop myself from saying something horrible. But yeah. Fuck them kids. Fuck them kids. Um, I, look, wait, so I mean, many, like, I, I, so it's many not that I, God awful, inappropriate jokes just ran through my head. <laughs> yeah. I, I, it's not that I don't understand where you're coming from, but also I need you to take a step back and realize that you were the one who goes to bat for my dad's gone crazy on fucking um, the Eminem show. <laughs> you know what works about that is that my dad's gone crazy. Haley is just singing the hook here. It's crazy to be in the ocean and lazy to drown. 
crazy like this there's a dark hell waiting for you it's not what we want it's like that it's crazy like drowning like a little cat <laughs> i didn't need to hear that it's just funny <laughs> Yeah, no, it is. It is. It's certainly like, I'm not like saying, putting my c- critical head on and saying, this no, six-year-old, this six-year-old's peen game is whack. It's just like, <laughs> let me say, as much as, as annoying this as I find his work on that song. game is not up to the quality of his fun. As as you know, he will never be successful. Where are the bars well, at, Lil Ace? Lil, Lil, Lil Ace, as retire bitch. <laughs> annoying as I find him on that song. Um, no, I think that he is demonstrating at a very young age potential at his craft that is there i just worry about such a young person being if they actually want to continue doing this being on such a public album at such a young age i don't look i don't think it's that serious i just think that it's funny it's, no yeah i yeah, mean no, like, i it's agree just... i just think about other people who try to make a career of this after being public at a young age and how much they have embarrassed themselves and uh, it's I, not like he's going to get cancelled for the drowning like a cat line. I'm not talking about that kind of embarrassing yourself I'm talking about like <laughs> hashtag little aces over party I'm talking about like Jaden Smith's sire you know like well, yeah. okay hold on difference here Jaden Smith's sire is something he is literally proud of like he is yeah. glad he made that record he is not embarrassed at all even though he probably should be yeah. Well, no, exactly. It's, it's not a probably. Also, okay, let's not that. And also, open, open Mike Eagle's son is not Will Smith's son. It's just... <laughs> that, that too. Sure, sure of yeah. course, of course. Anyway, uh, that's my review. I'm done. Someone else can go. Uh, don't everybody leap all at once. I just, yeah. I'm just trying to figure out what August is doing. Trying to in- inject the pen ink into my cheek. That's what are you? Bad. Don't do that. Are you That's like funny. piercing your ear with a pen? Piercing my cheek with a pen. Thank you right. very much. I guess I can do a thing. Is it been another uh, episode of non sequiturs with August. Same day. So uh, you know, uh, I I guess uh, the the first thing that should be said is what's already been said a trillion times already this is a very inconsistent album but i do i personally find it overall quite satisfying i think uh the opener uh death parade is like nice and melodic and yet it has a very certainly aggressive quality to it the snare drums in particularly kind of subtly underline Mike's lyrics and contrast the calmer instrumental bits of this. Uh, head ass, a uh, really solid feature from Video Dave. I found the chorus a little obnoxious. A lot of that is by the virtue of how it was like post-produced with the like quick cutting, cutting, cutting after he says ass on my head and that just being looped. Didn't find that particularly appealing but uh this this track solidly establishes this as the uh our mad lads of albums with the uh peter dinklage bar <laughs> oh that fucking kills me every t- okay actually Perfect most relatable moment peter dinklage. <laughs> most relatable moment on the album is not when he says it's october and i'm tired it's when he with legitimate and actual frustration goes man what the fuck is wrong with me <laughs> <laughs> I will say that <laughs> for, say, for yeah, my mocking of when, it, when it, he it's says good. that there's some shrinkage, perfect time to repeat Peter Dinklage. I hope he doesn't get offended. He'll probably never hear this. Is um that's a relatable flow of ideas if ever I have heard one. No, it's no. I mean, I'm I'm not criticizing it for that. I'm saying that's no, that's, that's what makes it good. Yeah, uh, yeah Spider Man. Yeah. Spider-Man's, yeah. Nice. Very nice. Half eyes. So much. Uh, Borat two is out. Yeah. I uh, think. I think the most relatable um, line on this album is um, "I feel you." This is a head ass support group. <laughs> is that that is this podcast? Uh-huh. This is a head ass support yeah. group. The most, so, relate, yeah. the most relatable line on this album is when he's like, "Maybe I'm not a snorkeling person on the closer." <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, <laughs> Sweatpants Spider-Man gives us a nice uh, 
commentary on Mike kind of letting go of himself, entering middle age, reinforcing this kind of nerdy aesthetic purveying this album, which I, I do think that aesthetic, well, I think a lot of people could rightfully call it like cringy air quotes. I mean, I think it just adds to the personality of this record. I think it's a rather endearing fact that as Jake has made the point of makes Mike just an every man that he knows the pop cultures. He can relate to the youths. Yeah, he talks uh, about the Shinjis and the Joe Stars. I know what those are. How do you speaking do of a, kids. Speaking of a uh, JoJo's character, uh, Bushiati yeah. uses the uh, zipper as, of course, an allusion to the stand of Bruno Bushiati, sticky fingers, or as it's translated in English as zipper man, which was supposed to be what the chorus said instead of the like uh pulling my zipper man that pulling my zipper down or whatever the hell it was supposed to say i summon the zipper man which i think is a much funnier chorus and i don't (laughs) i i i I wish that was how it was finalized and i'd have to agree with the sentiment that the song runs on for just way too long uh us aces bop I think is a song that is just really far too cluttered and it feels for me really uncomfortable in like its presentation and how the whole song comes together and I'm just not a fan of Little Ace on this album. Uh, Yeah, we've we've spoken about that, how uh, it's... It's maybe not the best. I I get it. You love your son, and you convey that in uh, Edge of New Clothes, I think, rather well, using his son. I think it's Edge of New Clothes. No, it's Aces Bob. Never mind. But the the part in Aces Bob that works for me, yeah, is the the chorus where he, he makes reference to his son being able to bring him down to, to earth and, like, ground him. I think that part of the song really works. Aces feature... Eh, not not particularly. Edge of New Clothes, I, I thought had a kind of weak hook. I wasn't really into that track, mostly because of that. And uh, Everything Ends the Last Year, just amazing. We've talked about the, the fantastic line. I love the, the kind of intention and purpose that went behind putting out this album now and having that line there. And yeah, the... The end it ended where the beat just sharply cuts off, hits me every time. Beautiful stuff. The Black Mirror episode, really fun bop about a really dark topic. It just is so energizing, and he's able to bring such an amount of levity and fun to that song, which I think a lot of, which I think is a very bold brave thing to do that I don't think a lot of other rappers or people in general would feel comfortable doing, just putting that out in the open and making it a really fun, catchy song. Or even something that they would like do well. Yeah. Do well, yes. Yeah. Uh, I'm a Joe star. Really love the, uh, really love that song. I, I thought the beat was maybe one of the, the more underwhelming on this album, but I did find the lyricism and really fun, playful, uh, very referential to the uh, JoJo's Bizarre Adventure franchise. I thought that really The Arsenio funny. Speedwagon one still fucking that, gets that's me such every a time. Good one. That's so funny. <laughs> really, really good song. Uh, Airplane Boneyard is the song I wish was the closer, but instead we have uh, the live track. No, it's the closer. You're, no, you're right. It, uh, oh, I, I seem to have, I seem to have put in my notes there was some kind of live track on this album, mm-hmm. but I, I think you've, you've quite clearly corrected me that that I must be mistaken. No, you made a, you, you you made a misconception there. Yep. Oh no. Hmm. Let me check my let me check my notes. What does this say here? Live track? Not anymore. And it, Dude, more? This, this this album would go up like a point and a half without that. Hmm. See, nothing in my notes about a live track anymore. 
Oh god. Anyway, Euthanize guys. this bit, please. It's over. It's been killed. I, Tyler, I 100% thought you were about to say euthanize little ace. <laughs> 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 hey, I'm just, uh, that's I'm just Jake, glad. Jake, that's on you. I know. I'm just, <laughs> Megan, I still thought it was gonna happen. happen. I'm, just, I'm just glad nobody's made a no wonder his life wife left him joke. <laughs> oh. You just you said it. it's there. It exists now. No, nah, no. No. Look, 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 look. look. Should have came with a content warning. I, I would happily. <laughs> be tied and married so of my giggle before logic and I don't think that's controversial. God no. These mic references good anime like Jesus fucking logic, Christ. Lo- logic can't even wrap Christmas presents. This is a throwback to a previous episode of the Champs and Tea podcast in which we reviewed logic and Taylor Swift like fucking idiots. Logic just Quite. looks like he watches Naruto. Like you just look at him and like you, <laughs> you watch Naruto and that's it. Okay. Oh my god. Where, where were we? August Morgan. Morgan. Oh, yeah, Morgan's the only one left. Okay. Oh, you're done. Oh, okay. Um. Yeah, yeah, from the consensus, I largely agree with the group. Um, I do think this is a very solid album. Um. It's one of the, the the funniest things I've consumed all year. Um, I was just about falling out of my chair on the first time I heard head ass. Um, <laughs> head, but, head ass to kiss prime. And, and really the, uh, the big draw of the album, and I assume with... Uh, Mike's other albums. This is the first album I've heard from him. Um, but I assume the draw, the biggest draw of the other albums is just Mike himself as a yep. writer, as a as a presence, as a rapper. Just, mm. just I mean, it's it it's just so clearly like identifiably who this person is and what he does as an artist, and I really enjoy that about the record. Um, it's just got a lot of personality, and that shows on pretty much every track. Um, but where I sort of struggle with the record is just that, for me personally, I don't. F- there, there, and don't get me wrong. There's certainly a lot of, or a fair amount of like, great beats and soundscapes here, but. For me, I think a lot of the sonic elements of this album just don't really come together for me or really hit home for me at all. Um, I can't really point to why, but I find a lot of them kind of meandering and just generally uninteresting. Like the the, the one-two punch of Sweatpants Spider-Man and Bukirati. Bu- Bukirati. Yeah, that one. The, uh, fuck it, the three punch of that, those two and Ace's bop are just, I mean, tanks the, the pacing of the album for a while there. Um, but uh, there's, there's definitely some, some really great songs here that justify it existing just by themselves, like Death Parade and Headass and the uh, uh, Everything Ends Last Year and the Black Mirror episode and What the Fuck is Self Care. Um, I feel like what the fuck is self care especially hit home to me just yeah. because I'm like, I don't, I understand it as a concept, but like, I can't. Like, when I mean, like doesn't he like, say like, yeah, but like, what is it though? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm like, like, yeah. Like whenever people are starting like, just, just, just meditate for a little while. And oh, just, like, oh just, God. Like, fuck I, that though. I can't, I, mean, medit- I can't do it. I'm incapable. Like any anyone who like sees that you're in like a depressed state or an anxiety ridden state, you're just not doing well, or the world is fucking you. Then and there's like, wow, you should just practice like mindfulness. Fuck them. Like that's not gonna fucking. My problem help me. in the first place is that I'm too fucking mindful, which is why I'm so fucking depressed. Yeah. Like, um, look, if meditation you- works for you, go fucking off. But self care is different for everyone, as this song fucking yes. says. Yes. 
You know, like for me, self care is a trip to McDonald's. I'm not trying to go to my fucking meditate or something. If I sit here in silence, all I'm going to think about how everything is how everything is doomed. I feel that like so it, much more good. <laughs> just Alexa, play processed by the boys. <laughs> Meditation just don't work. Oh, I just I felt I felt seen. Um, Do you know who was processed by the boys? Oh God! Who? Trans, oh God! Translucent. Um. What? That's a reference to the hit show oh. The Boys. Oh, right. That's I awesome. get it. That was that was actually kind of funny. On, on the yeah. front. <laughs> I knew right where she was going. Yeah. Ooh, thank you. We clearly have uh, a long way to go to get to Mr. Michael Eagle's level of um, <laughs> comedic bravura. <laughs> what, is, what, what is this wee shit? Honestly, Morgan, like, just, I don't, I can't really explain it, but, like, this album has your energy. Like, yeah, there's just does. a lot of this that, like, when he speaks very frankly, I'm just like, I feel like this is how Morgan thinks. It it is, um, which is which Head is on my ass. <laughs> I mean, that's why I laugh so hard at it because it's like this is just exactly my sense of humor. Um, and like Jake was talking about earlier, when in the part where like he's like yelling, like shit should have come with the content warning. I was just like, I have been this mad about things like this before. <laughs> um, which I. It really just kind of makes it a shame that I find a fair chunk of it kind of uninvolving. Um, but yeah, good album. Dark Comedy is your record. Okay. I, I, it also features the funniest thing that he's ever done, which is a song that features Hannibal Burris. <laughs> it may be the funniest yeah. thing he's ever done. Okay. Well, shall let's move on. Yaris! It's Maybe. called Doug Stamper. <laughs> uh, we, sh we should uh, wrap this up. Yeah. Um, Fuck is Doug Stamper? <laughs> Such a funny name. Let's. Favorite tracks and ratings. Yep. Yes. Favorite tracks and ratings. Uh, Jake. James and T. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And My three favorite tracks are. Let's see. The Edge of New Clothes, Everything Ends Last Year, and this is hard. Um, I'll say, what the fuck is self-care? Least favorite, uh, I will agree with the consensus, while I do not find either of uh, Lil Ace's um, appearances on this album to be nearly as grating as everyone else does, I guess I just, like, I have the reverse cilantro gene here. Um, I will say <laughs> the easy pick for the weakest song on the album is the closer 15 20 feet ocean nah so I that's hate the that. weakest track. i just my biggest problem with that track is the name that's i mean yeah that's, Nonsense. That, that is entirely fair um and i give the album an eight out of ten it's good Sick. august and my three favorite tracks probably have to be the black mirror episode I am a Joe Star and a uh, Death Parade. My least favorite. I'm going to go with uh, the. I'm going to read the room, go with the consensus. Uh, and my rating is a 7 out of 10. That's Steve Buscemi. That's Steve Buscemi out of 10. Yep. Uh, my three favorite. Very good in Barton Fink. Ask Me is my favorite or ticker song title. Morgan, what are your three favorite tracks? Least favorite track and rating. Thank you. Um, my three favorite tracks are um, Head Ass, uh, What the Fuck is Self Care, and Death Parade. Y'all right? Yeah, just the way you, what your voice sounds, your accent when you say the word head ass is just... It's like honey. It's it, that is a very Kentuckyism. Yeah, exactly. It's like uh, is it just just head ass. Yeah. <laughs> and whenever you say that, I just think of um, Holly Hunter. I think it is in Raising Arizona. Yep. Just going. I love him so much. <laughs> so much. 
Wow, I don't Jay, know. Jay, that was really that was impeccable. <laughs> I don't know how to t- I don't know how to take this. <laughs> oh, I wish I was Holly Hunter. You are being uh, compared same. to Holly Hunter. It is a good thing. Yeah. I I I'm just I'm just so we're just so we're all clear. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, no surprises, my least favorite is fifteen twenty feet ocean nah, which I mean it's just like it sounds like he put he started typing words. <laughs> and he let auto correct on his iPhone. Fucking Tom York, <laughs> that shit was just like random word generator. Go. It's more cogent when he did it. Uh, six and a half out of ten. Understandable. That, that's me. Then I go up to Morgan. Um, Sweatpants Spider Man. Love that track. What the fuck is self care? Solid fucking song. And um, everything ends last year is one of his best. I just wish um, the album was one of his best. Um, I agree with the worst track, and I'm giving this a seven and a half out of ten. Um, it's it's so funny. Like uh, I kind of came after Sasha a bit for being a bit unfairly harsh in my opinion, and I'm going to give a lower rating than she did. Yeah, that was. I mean, that's <laughs> awkward for me too. My three favorite tracks are Death Parade, The Edge of New Clothes, and The Black Mirror Episode. Uh, my least favorite track is 15, 20 Feet Ocean. Nah. Uh, yeah. I don't have a joke. It's bad. <laughs> I didn't expect you to. Live from the joke, O oh, Cruise. Um, it's, Fuck off. It's, what are you fucking talking about? <laughs> That's what the song is subtitled, live from the Joko Cruise. Jesse, what the fuck are you talking about? <laughs> uh, and I'm giving a 6.5. Fair enough. Okay, so that is 7.1 overall. Mm-hmm. Um, what's the rating I can give for context? Um, uh, okay. Smash Mouth All Star. <laughs> <laughs> we gave um, a noisy talk. August's extended riff on the history of Earth. Is it was it seven point one ratings or was it seven point two? Last week you talked about uh, how we. What did you say? Oh, it's uh, one. It's the one. Uh, it's the one against me album in black dresses. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, there's two out of context for uh, our viewers. Let's move yeah, on. Yeah. Well, anyway, so Oak Mike Eagle got seven point one. We gave Noisy Todd a 7.3 for context. And we also gave Russ and Kelly's new record a 7.3. Good stuff. Um, so next week, oh, first of all, let us know what you think of the Autiker album and or the Open Mike Eagle album in the comments below. Uh, please feel free to give us any constructive criticism, feedback, or just generally anything. We value or your interactions. Tell us that too. Yeah, exactly. It's. Uh, I mean, look, we will definitely, if you tell us that you hate us, we'll almost definitely make fun of you on the episode after that. But yeah. do it anyway. Yeah. If you're actually even watching this part of the episode, you're a fucking champ and I love you. Um, yeah. uh, so next week we're going to be reviewing uh, this day, you know, I, I think these definitely will be staying the same because the only one that has respected. the possibility of changing is a Mountain Goats record and no. I will not allow that to no. change if we have to review something else next week it's going to be in addition to these two because I don't want to yeah. move either of them but next week we're going to be reviewing the new Clipping album Visions of Bodies Being Burned and the new Mountain Goats album Getting Into Knives Can I plug um, something? Was that? No. Can, can I plug something? No. no. Well, I'm going to do it anyway. So, um, in the Cut week this on this out. channel that you're watching now, between now and when that episode is uploaded, um, I will be dropping a worst to best episode on the Mountain Goats. Oh, um, wow. Not, not including getting into knives, but I hope you'll watch it. Yeah, that'll be exciting. That will and be. Next week is a Sir Shakur week, just generally. I mean, yeah. Yeah. damn. Yeah. Well, yeah. Uh, Fantastic. So now is the time, if you're still watching, for you to switch over to our uh, Square Pusher review, which is our record club review for this week. Uh, I've watch seen it the f- tomorrow. I've seen the future, and it's a fantastic episode. Um, <laughs> so yeah, go and check that out, and and yeah, let us know what you think of these records, and basically, thank you for watching. Uh, rock over London. Rock, rock on, on Chicago. On Chicago. Sega, the more you play with it, the harder it gets. <laughs>